you all for coming. I'm Hayat Alvi. I'm a civilian academic in the National Security Affairs Department. I am very, very pleased to see such a great turnout. And in advance, I'd like to wish everyone happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and, uh, and a very shiny Happy New Year. Uh, I got a couple of things I want to mention, uh, kind of uh, uh, admin stuff. One, please silence your phones and devices. Secondly, uh, I really want to thank very deeply and sincerely the Naval War College Foundation for providing the refreshments. Uh, help yourselves if you haven't yet. Uh, I also want to thank the events department, the graphics, and uh, the public affairs department. They all were great troopers in helping me out putting this together. So what we're going to do first is uh, I asked um, Admiral Harley to give a few words and share his thoughts about this inaugural conference on genocide. The Naval War College has never had this topic as a conference before. You are part of the creators of the very first one. So thank you and congratulations for that. So with that, I'd like to ask Admiral Harley to come up and share his thoughts. Thank you, Admiral. So they usually ask me to come talk for 45 to 60 minutes uh, at the introduction of these things. I really uh, only have a moment or so. We were having a, a lunch with, uh, with Ruth, and, uh, and it was an extraordinary discussion. And you know, one of the questions that, uh, of course, is very appropriate at an event like this is, you know, what, why now? Why this topic? And I think we all really know the answer to that already. I share from my own personal experiences, which could certainly never match some of the, the tragedy and, and the pity of war that occurs for what we study here. But this college studies not only the warfare, but the prevention of warfare as well. And that's why I think these topics are, are so important. And I remember a few years ago, was blessed or cursed to tour Auschwitz. And I said, okay, historical site is going to be, you know, particularly illuminating. But I tell you, it haunts you from the moment you can take the tour. And it will haunt me for the rest of my days. Because it is of such magnitude, and you still see people denying the, the existence of these events. But you truly understand the inhumanity of man against man. And you have the opportunity to see things like that. We have folks here, God bless you, who have experienced uh, these kinds of events and uh, the real pity of all of this, these circumstances. And so you know, I think the, you know, the value in studying this is a simple recognition that we cannot let these types of things happen again. You know, I think the idea behind the case of slow genocide, cases of slow genocide, should be a recognition that genocide is occurring today in many different places throughout the world. We certainly have many historical examples of these particular tragedies. But this is all the more reason why we must continue the study of these types of events, that we must together band in our understanding so that we can together ensure that they never happen again. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention. I'm so excited uh, to, to be a part of this inaugural event. I, I know uh, Dr. Alvey's uh, extraordinary work here at the college. Uh, we're, we're joined by a, a number of our great academic team, Dr. Beamy and, and uh, Dr. Lane. Uh, and so many more as I look out into this extraordinary gallery. But it's in the minds of men that you know, wars are constructed as the UNESCO saying would go, and it's in the minds of men that we must develop these constructs for peace. God bless us, everyone. Have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. the format of the conference and it's a little bit of an unusual start because we start with the conversation between Mrs. Ruth Oppenheim and myself. So that'll be the first thing and then after that 
uh, our first panel will come up, and some of them have, uh, the panelists have slides, PowerPoint slides that they will use in their presentations. Uh, Dr. Don Feeney will be the moderator for panel one, and I will be the moderator for panel two. And there will be about a 15 minute break in between the panels. So this is what we're looking for as we proceed during the conference. Uh, so now what I want to uh, just kind of explain to you is I'll be seated with Mrs. Oppenheim and we agreed to have a back and forth and I have a list of questions that I'll ask her and she'll respond first, uh, she'll give a, a brief synopsis of her experience in Kristallnacht and uh, after that we will go back and forth with question and answer um, and you will you will be very moved. I heard, I had the privilege of hearing Mrs. Oppenheim speak back in November. She came here for a lecture of opportunity. And she's magnetic and she's extremely moving. So uh, please relish every moment and take in every word that she has to say. Okay? I want to first adjust your chair because you were comfortable. So
father never spoke of what happened on the market square, but later we heard from others that the Nazis um, uh, asked the Jewish men to destroy the Torah scroll um, while they demolished the small one room synagogue. My father, as the leader of the Jewish congregation, refused to destroy what he had always considered sacred, despite relentless beatings. The thanks of the Vaterland is what Germany had promised him when he received his Iron Cross for valiant service in an elite army unit in World War I. This then was his thanks. Why did they eventually relent? Maybe someone called out that he fought in the war for the Vaterland. Finally, finally, they let him drag himself away from the market square, weighed down with the heavy Torah scroll and with his disillusionment. He rescued the Torah and brought it to America and donated it to a New York synagogue. My brother read from that Torah on this bar mitzvah day, and so did my grandson. My father and the other Jewish men were imprisoned in a local jail, a converted barn owned by a policeman who, had, uh, who was embarrassed about the imprisonment of townspeople whom he had known for a lifetime. In the cities, the men were sent to concentration camps. After Kristallnacht, Jews were not allowed to attend German schools, and we traveled by train to a Jewish school quite a distance away. The total focus for everyone was the desperate search for any country in the world that might accept Jews. America was the top choice, but you needed a low quota number and an affidavit guaranteeing that you would not become a financial burden. Eventually, we realized that we would have to separate. My oldest sister left for America at the age of 15 in May of 1939 because a teenager required less money. My father left in August of 39 with the hope that he could earn enough money to supply an affidavit for us. A month later, on September 3rd, 1939, war in Europe broke out. Then we had little hope of ever being reunited. We felt abandoned in a country that hated us and a world that did not want Jews. We were not allowed to in public bomb shelters during the air raids. Instead, we huddled together in our cold cellar. The damp grayness of the cellar walls reflected the cold fear that had become so much a part of our lives. That we miraculously were able to leave Germany in January 1940 is a story in itself. We traveled by train to Rotterdam, Holland, with Nazis on board until we reached the border. We sat terror-stricken on cold wooden train benches afraid to look up, lest the Nazis decide to drag us from the train. We only realized that we had crossed the border when jubilation broke out and passengers prayed and cried, knowing that we had all escaped. The two-week voyage on the Vaindam, one of the last passenger ships to cross the Atlantic during the war was a harrowing trip as we sailed through submarine-infested waters. Arriving in Hoboken, New Jersey, 
Reunited with my father and sister, we faced a new world filled with challenges and opportunities. My gratitude and devotion to America defies expression. They can only go one at a time. They can only turn on one at a time. Hers is still on. She has to just press the button. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Um, thank you, Mrs. Oppenheim. I'm going to ask the first question and then turn it over to her to answer. Mrs. Oppenheim, you and I talk quite a bit about the importance of the memory of trauma. Would you share with this audience some of those thoughts and points about the importance of memory of trauma and why it is still pertinent in the 21st century? Trauma has deeply affected me and has influenced my life and the lives of my children. I was uh, 11 years old on the Stalna on November 9, 1938. And trauma was not a concept that we was either in vogue or that I was aware of. I only realized in later years that I had been traumatized and that it had affected my life. Only upon returning to Germany with my family, in 1968, 30 years later, after Kristallna, did I confront that reality and how much I had blocked out in the intervening years. In tears most of the time, which pained my family, I visited our former house, the cemetery where my ancestors are buried and the schoolyard where I stood watching my classmates play while I wished for invisibility. I visited my elementary school teacher, Fräulein Tietz, who had treated me fairly <coughs> and whom I had much admired. When I came to America in 1940, my main thrust was to Americanize I felt utterly relieved to have escaped Nazi Germany and to be reunited with my family. <clears throat> Though I faced difficult situations in school and at home, my focus was on achieving. I may have dealt with trauma by high motivation, by excelling, and by blocking out much of the past. I had the benefit of being part of a family unit. My older sisters were protected. By the way, they never fully faced their trauma and sadly seemed more damaged. During busy married years with child-bearing and career pursuits, I did not focus on introspection and trauma. Only later, alone with time to, to think and contemplate, I realized how trauma has affected my life, and I regret that it must have had an effect on my children. <coughs> Last week, uh, on December 10th, Benedict Carey had an article in the New York Times on inherited trauma discussing the epigenetic markers of trauma that can be transferred from one generation to another. One can inherit traces from parents' and grandparents' experience, particularly their suffering. The memory of trauma is important in that it acknowledges the existence of trauma instead of keeping it within, which is so destructive. 
acknowledgement as a first step in dealing with trauma and the healing process. So often, a war of silence engulfs us. For me, the realization of trauma came later in life. I confronted memories even as physical strengths waned. Yes, memory of trauma is still important in the 21st century. War and famine are prevalent, and so is post-traumatic stress. Fortunately, we have greater knowledge and greater ability to help in the healing process. I'll just use yours so we don't go back and forth. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Ackerman. Uh, those were such important points about memory of trauma. My next question is, does the resurgence of neo-Nazi and other supremacist groups today upset you? What are your warnings to the younger generation about these alarming trends? I'm deeply troubled and concerned by these movements and the recent Pittsburgh shooting. Will it never end? Will Jews always be scapegoats? My grandchildren have questioned me on the subject, and I have reassured them that I don't compare it to Nazi Germany, where it was a government decree, and where the government, where the German population acquiesced. Good neighbors watched us on that Pistana night as we hid behind beer barrels on a cold November night, but they did not offer shelter. They were afraid. In contrast, the Christian and Muslim community showed support and outrage after Pittsburgh shooting. Learning about the history of Holocaust is a strong reminder also to the younger generation. We all have the ability and responsibility to confront hate. Education and awareness are important. <coughs> Organizations like the Washington Holocaust Museum have major programs to combat escape movements. At a recent event in Washington, I attended a discussion on what is driving the rise of white supremacy and neo-Nazism and how to counter it. Another topic was, can technology and civic engagement disrupt extreme movements? It is a frightening situation to, which defies easy answers. Thank you, Mr. Alderman. My last question is, what is your advice about acceptance and inclusion? My childhood in Nazi Germany exposed me to the extremes of intolerance and discrimination. In school, I was delegated to the faculty classroom. I was not allowed to participate. Other students were not allowed to talk to me, even during recess. Jews were the enemy. I always felt like other, and that feeling has remained with me partially because my former European upbringing sets me apart. I'm not as casual as most Americans. I envy them for a sense of confidence and of belonging, of speaking up without intimidation, whereas I am constantly aware of whether my action might cause more anti-Semitism. If we could only reach acceptance of each other's differences, tolerance is not enough. 
unless tolerance is used in the sense of I have no tolerance for discrimination. Through education, teaching, and community discussions, we can try to eradicate hate and bigotry, exposure to people of different backgrounds and culture is vitally important. On a person-to-person -person level, prejudice often reigns. I have no easy answers on that one either. But you have enlightened us tremendously, and we want to thank you for coming today. This concludes our conversation with Mrs. Oppenheim. Please join me in thanking her. That's great. Good afternoon. My name is Don. Uh, you can read the bio if you want to. You can board by it. For those of you from north of the Mason Dixon line, I trust you to prepare for my sub speech and type it. Um, but I'd like to wish everyone a good afternoon, Adam Carly, especially Mrs. Oppenheimer, fellow panelists, faculty, students, and our guests. Uh, it's humbling honor to be on this panel and included among such distinguished scholars on a difficult topic. Uh, I'd especially like to thank Dr. Albany for taking the time, the interest, and energy to put together this conference. <coughs> and before I go any further, please let me state for the record that my comments and my own personal and professional obligations based on 27 years of practical experience and study. They should in no way be misconstrued as speaking from the United States Naval War College, the United States Navy, the Departments of Navy and Defense, and other U.S. government. Uh, we were talking at lunch, you know, a question came up, why should we be I think it's especially appropriate that we do this at the Naval War College. As Naval Expeditionary Forces operating in an era of sustained contingency have been and will be continue to be called upon to perform missions of this type. In fact, 26 years ago this month, President George H.W. Bush addressed the nation's Naval Office, informing them that U.S. forces would be sent to Somalia as part of UNTAP, authorized under a U.N. Chapter 7 mandate. While many components of the joint force possess unique capabilities, only maritime forces provide the depth of rapid response resources to intercede in unstable environments where genocide and mass atrocities usually occur. <coughs> so, this short talk is not meant to encompass the totality of genocide and addiction and mass atrocity prevention and responsibility to protect. Rather, I will set the stage for our following panels and discussions to narrow this focus to the essence of intervention and decisions. It must be made by external actors in a volatile, ambiguous, and complex operational environment. And lest anyone think this is directly tied to the United States, remember that Ethiopia contributes more peacekeepers to the mission than anyone else, and that China and India also figure in the top ten. So when we strip away when we strip away the fog of conflicting information, the myriad writings on intervention, just war theory, what we're left with are decisions. Decisions to intervene or not. And not necessarily in the defense of our own borders, but in reaction to external crises based on our own core interests, allies, domestic politics, and foreign policy. It's the nature of these decision points and the context within which they take place that help us to understand this perhaps a little bit better. While there are almost countless <coughs> issues and many levels, there are four cornerstone considerations for decision making of the genocide and mass atrocity in the world. The conditions themselves, how, when, and access. Each of these, in turn, are informed by many other factors. Some of which will be noted along the way without fully developing in this area. These four cornerstones, in turn, inform seven critical decisions for senior defenders. So the conditions themselves frame the art of possible with intervention operations. The first thing is to discern what is actually happening. We can break these down into five categories of intelligence, stages, diplomacy, forces available, and context. Now, we look at indications and warning, knowing what is really happening in order to make informed decisions is rather difficult. It's perhaps counterintuitive, but it's not the lack of information that attends these crises, but the conflict.
confusion of information that precludes easy decision making. So we have to ask ourselves if the traditional intelligence approach provides the best possible information in time to make effective decisions. And this leads us to the first decision point. We have to devote resources to deciding, detecting, identifying, and tracking those indicators of potential pending genocide or mass atrocity operations. Now, contrary to popular belief, the intelligence community does not possess nameless abilities or idle and those remaining for the next crisis. Rather, every decision to focus on one issue means an opportunity cost for focusing on another issue. But nonetheless, if we use some framing mechanism, uh, we can take a look at stages that are not perfectly stacked like Russian North Russia calls, but they're useful for academic consideration and pragmatic planning. And focusing the efforts of the intelligence community and professionals in support of the decision making. So when you take a look at these, and the literature is vast, and I'll try to make it simple. It, there's the rationalization, the identification, the expulsion, concentration, the reduction, starvation, and finally, the direct personal toll. Yet outside the sphere of this itself, diplomatic actions, based on nuanced decision points, must be initiated and carried through the implementation. This leads to more questions than it does answers. With or without the UN, unilateral or multilateral. Chapter 6, Peaceful Settlement of Disputes, or Chapter 7, Threats to Peace, Breaches of Peace, and Acts of Aggression. These are but a few of the decisions that leaders must make in the left of activation of decision systems. How and when these decisions are made, though, structure the art of the possible for all follow up operations. But we must, we must remember that bad initial policy executed. We nonetheless flounder in the grass in these types of operations. So one of the first things you have to figure out is what kind of force do you want to use? Sometimes people have really good ideas, and they are wholly inappropriate to the operation at hand. So the amphibious bicycle idea from the British forces in World War I, it looks funny now. This was a real idea in World War I from perhaps some way to get across the stormy fields of Flanders. Rather, forces available means matching force design, sourcing, and authorities to match mission requirements. It is the scope and nature of R2P, HADR, and other associated type operations continues to change. It is an enduring challenge to source a properly configured, commanded, and capable force to attain mission goals in an austere, expeditionary, and operating environment. The next thing you have to take a look at is the context in which it happens. These include civil war and other pre-existing conditions that limit and challenge the freedom of action for any intervention force. If all were quiet and peaceful, there would be no need for that intervention force to be there. But when one surveys the group of actions that comprise the majority of mass atrocities, genocide, ethnic cleansing, the like over the last 120 years, one finds that they usually take place inside of a contingent to a crisis. Which then leads us to the hard question, perhaps, of just how are you going to do this? There are many small factors, but the four macro factors of how are timing, speed, scope, and depth of force. Remember that even as these are distinct factors, they work to integrate into simultaneously, leaving additional fog and friction, even as leaders consider options and make decisions and decision points to. So the timing of the decision is critical. These decisions must be made before forces or other tools of national power can be brought to bear. As we cover the when here, we'll talk about how to bring all of this together in a coherent manner to provide what tier three of the responsibility to protect identifies as timely, decisive action. Thus, decision point two is determining at what point in the state is identified before a country will commit forces and political capital to act. Conversely, deciding not to intervene is still a decision with its own set of consequences. Now, volumes have been written on just what timely, decisive, and action mean. But if we think of them as speed, scope, and force, we can ascertain the actual decisions that the leaders must make and what the go and no go may look like. So, speed in any operation generates its own success, but haste makes waste. 
or as my loyal Marine colleagues used to say, less haste, more speed. Speed is enabled by preset plans, concepts, doctrine, force, and human mindsets. sets. But when every tool is a hammer, every problem resumes the proverbial nail. Over the past decade, multiple organizations attempted to write various planning guides and insert language into national security strategy documents to which processes and plans could be pinned. At the same time, if the plan on the shelf does not fit the current challenge, then planners and decision makers alike find themselves prisoners of the plan or the plan twice phenomenon. Speed in this case, though, also entails not only operational risk to the force, but to the political leaders who must make those decisions, all while the media and the pundits opine on the best way to do something. But the cruel fact of the matter is that all of this is going on. People are dying, albeit at various rates. A rash decision may leave a few people satisfied, and an intervention that seemingly never ends because the transition criteria cannot be met as long as people are in the hospital. It takes decades, perhaps centuries, to build a piece. It only takes days, weeks, or months to destroy it. Put differently for the engineers in the downhill speed is always faster than uphill speed. So this leads us to decision point number three, which is the scope. And as evidenced in many operations from East Timor and Kurdistan to Sierra Leone, Libya, and Mali, important decisions must be made as to the scope of the response. <clears throat> Remembering Colin Powell's pottery problem, practitioners, both military and political, must be aware of mission change or creep, as Dr. Derek Reverend lays out in his book, which fundamentally changes the nature of the response which in turn may well require the scoping of the tools made to the to the decision. Decision point number three, then, is to what extent will an intervention be? As we mentioned earlier, it will be multilateral, unilateral, chapter six, chapter seven, or will it be something unique and different? And while the positioning of forces may, in some cases, provide a deterrent, it must also be remembered that history is full of genocide-like cases. Well, an external force considered to be a deterrent or a flexible deterrent option, the intended recipient of that deterrence perceives provocation. Indeed, pillar one of the RTP is to prevent genocide mass atrocities from happening in the first place. <clears throat> but frequently, the course of human events, accelerated by modern technology, these things tend to spread faster than the Santa Ana Field California wildfire. It is likely of bombing also noted in his cautionary comment, force alone cannot create peace. The other challenge is getting the force right, right size, right composition, importantly, the right commander with the right bullets. I use the Sierra Leone example in the way it worked for the British because they have the right headquarters, PGHQ, the right forces, Paris, Royal Marines, and Special Operations Forces, the right commander, so the Richards, the right authorities, directly from number 10, with the right foreign and the law office official co located, co located with General Richards and Sierra Leone to integrate all decisions and subsequent actions. Force alone cannot create peace, but apply a joint. It can repair some societal damage and set conditions for a return to at least a rough peace to all trust is rebuilt. At the same time, national caveats for troop contributing nations, or TCMs, bedevil the ability to conduct these operations in a more national way. Further complicating the earlier noted challenge of speed. Trust me from personal experience. When the captain has a thorough that reaches directly back to his or her prime minister, your giving orders is interesting. Their national leader is fascinating. So, decision point number four is about the authorization of the force. It would only be allowed in self defense, requiring peacekeepers to receive fire before initiating it. Our intervention force commanders allowed attitude and discretion, when, where, and how that change. Which leads us to when. So you can see depicted here the British on the beach in Sierra Leone. Other than the decision to intervene itself, all the supporting decisions that lead to that point is about these executing missions and transitioning to withdrawal. The timing of the force insertion and subsequent actions is the core issue of genocide or mass atrocity in In a world where the CNN effect has been trumped by social media, the pressure to do something collides with the reality of doing what? A cursory assessment of when the factors indicate decision points over five and six. If we look at phasing, if we look 
following the rule of Russian principles of the three tier process, I want to have RSVP to prevent the reactive bill. Leaders are confronted with the tough choice of trying to categorize what the genocide is between these three phases, or the seven steps I outlined earlier, which gets us back to the topic of this conference. What do you do with the slogans? Regrettably, it's never this clear on the ground. Furthermore, each new operation is built voluntarily from scratch with the assumption that adequate resources can be found. And it's going to be run on individual budget supported administrative lines back to TCM. So if we go with prevent first, if the decision to intervene is made early, at risk of being made is neoliberalism or neocolonialism. The repercussions of this are cascaded by the success of Operation Provide Comfort, no doubt, in current Chinese actions in Somalia. The failed October 1993 wave of the issue, the failed white lockdown, in turn discouraged the Clinton administration from one, which in turn inspired more intervention in the Balkans in 1995 and 1999. It's sort of like trying to predict a pandemic until you see that it's hard and it very expensive to prepare for it. But once leaders do see it, even as the experts argue over the classification of what a phase actually is, it's too late to prevent forcing the recourse to react, which takes us back again to decision number two. When prevention opportunities fail to produce an effective preclusion of genocide and mass atrocity, the focus has to be shift to reaction. This cure of action is one of the most time-sensitive decisions that has existed. Kofi Annan summarized this in 1999. One of the problems with peacekeeping has been the speed of deployment. With each delay, the problem only gets worse. Leaders struggle to get accurate information, and in itself no small feat because the UN lacks an effective intelligence capability. And other nations are at best reluctant to reveal sources and methods and most likely have not devoted constrained intelligence resources to tracking a possible emerging event. To react effectively and seize the tactical and operational initiative from the perpetrators, building the force, establishing the authorities, and gaining access by three core decisions that must be converted into actionable operations. At the same time, the emerging concept of responsibility while protecting places even additional tethers on leaders of both the international level so the hard truth is that to stop an organized killing, there has to be a credible threat of qualifiers. Paratroopers and soldiers on street corners are good, but perpetrators killed by your literature forces are even better. Leaders realize this and they face the pragmatic dichotomy of watching forces prepared and capable of killing people in order to stop the killing and restore some semblance of peace. The number of decisions inherent in the appropriate action in a timely, decisive manner provides a wide latitude for varying interpretations, all of which are by cold comfort to the people being targeted in the area of genocide and its atrocity. Decision points number three and four apply here, but another way is the frame decision point number five, when we extract the forces. The reaction to events in the air across the spectrum of information with different reactions forces the interest in the transition decisions. Which leads us to this. Do you stay for rebuilding or not? Now, it's hard for me to tell in looking at this picture who's happy, the peacekeepers in the helicopter leaving, or the people on the ground waving at them departing. Having been one of the guys in the helicopter leaving, I'm betting my money on the helicopter. Um, but the decision is do you commit to that third piece of RTP and remain after the cessation of actions that caused the intervention in the first place? While R2P encourages the inclusion of rebuilding activities as part of the larger R2P concept, national leaders still make decisions about the development this leading effort. This might be broken down into two subordinate decisions, the decision to stay or leave. The second is determining what the conditions for transition are, and to whom, when, and how to picture the forces and transfer authorities. Now, access may be the most important factor that either enables or limits the ability of any intervention force to make a closed door decisions in the power. This is further exacerbated by the fact that drones and other instruments of air power are interesting, but armed troops with deadly force on every street corner are fascinating. It makes us look at who are the, fours, you know, who are the faces of the intervention force capabilities, will, and intent to stay power. Based on the operating conditions in which the forces will operate, you know, we are 
force to consume, but forces to seek and deploy, which in turn requires extensive diplomatic maneuvering and how to employ that force. You have to look at the physical and the human terrain to determine what kind of access that force will need to project and sustain the power. Well, peacekeeping may not have the same voracious appetite for logistics that the common arms regime does. That does not mean the footprint is invisible. Decision point number seven requires making the force compatible with the operational environment and adjusting accordingly. As for one example, you know you are in a different operational space when you stand on the Entebbe runway and watch four MI-24 runners fully up and painted in the UN white and blue in front of the airfield on a high village. Why? That's what that operational environment can When we take a look at ports of deforcation in the area of our seaports, a pods or S pods appear. These are critical implementing factors for these operations that reflect the balance between sea and air deployment, projection, and sustainment. Getting diplomatic clearances, establishing cargo haven capabilities, and deciding which parts of the joint force, <coughs> hopefully in concert with multinational partners, to deploy while accepting the opportunity cost in other areas of interest is not a small decision. To take Rwanda is a case study. It's 850 miles by road from Mombasa to Rwanda. It's 930 miles by road from Dar es Salaam. Antebi's a little bit closer. It's still 350 miles to Rwanda. I've driven some of those roads. If you can make 10 miles an hour, you're really, really pushing it. The total locations are easier to reach. Making some decisions or to access each other is still one of the challenges of the system. These examples are not limited to simple ways to see the life of the pandemic. Other panels to provide you details of Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Sudan and Sierra Leone. But I've been to some of these places and they're really hard to operate. When the forces operated in northern Iraq in 1991, it was a 500 mile, two lane road after ships. And the airfields of southern Turkey were not when it was started. So, some conclusions. The purpose of this short address was to debunk the myth that our mission capabilities will hide any critical difficulties in making effective decisions during the slow genocide of mass atrocity. The real question is finding the tipping point, but the sweet spot of decision making. Sending forces to one country or one region has strategic opportunity cost. Forces, for example, send to Somalia, they are now not available to be in one employed as somewhere else for the next challenge and send to see no decision to deploy is risk free, and the leaders are painfully aware of this moment. It's hard to determine in advance what the threshold is, and to establish, monitor, and enforce effective trip wires or so called red wires. In the dark steps, what are the real consequences of the intervention force and the force on target nation, force organization, especially in the column that almost all genocide and mass atrocities take place inside the So to put it up into one list, these decision points are not the only ones that must be made at multiple levels. Frequently simultaneously, but they provide a starting point from which practitioners, policymakers, and commanders can make informed choices. They are not a replacement for pragmatic assessments of operational environments as they are, not as one might wish them to be. Hard-earned practice and a growing body of sons of RCP literature inform these decision points. When, not if, the next clamor arises over the contingencies, which are slow or fast, knowing the types of decisions required will make the national leaders to make the best informed, least bad choice. It may well be true that in the words of Richard Holbrook, good policy executed badly becomes bad policy. But it is certain bad policy executed well is definitely still bad policy. The only difference between good and bad is in the decisions that we Finally, I'll this thought. Slow genocides may, in fact, be harder for decision makers to deal with effectively. As a decision must be made while the situation disintegrates as part of a larger complex problem, the people on the ground may well be slouching towards Bethlehem, even as national leaders grapple with the complexities of strategic decision making. If it is a civil war or a sustained insurrection, at what point do external actors decide to fly for us? Is not a really significant question. It is a devilish decision. Thank you.
did uh, Professor Ibrahim's uh, slides on the uh, We will have Q&A after they're both done. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be here. I want to give my sincere thanks to Hayat for them, uh, organizing this and to the admin for hosting us. I'm the author of this book here, The Rohingyas Inside Myanmar's Hidden Genocide. This was the first edition of the book and it had the title Hidden within it. But the, the next, the, the, the next um, uh, edition, which is this one, the title, the word hidden was removed for obvious reasons. Let me just tell you first of all how I got involved in all of this. I first heard of Rohingya, the actual word, over about half a decade ago. I read somewhere that these are the most persecuted minority in the world. And this is a title that many groups, are, you, you can argue, are buying for. So, I first uh, spent a number of years writing a number of op-eds and different publications just trying to raise awareness because I was genuinely very surprised that there's absolutely no coverage of these people at all. There was, not, there was no um, uh, book on the topic, there was no campaigns, there were no celebrity endorsements. They were literally, as the United Nations described them, the forgotten people. So I spent a number of years writing a number of op-eds. I wrote this policy briefing which was distributed to parliamentarians in the UK and the European Union. I then made a trip to the region in 2014 to collect testimonials from some of the survivors that I've made over the border into Bangladesh. And these are just some of the sketches that some of the conditions that the survivors of, uh, uh, of the Myanmar and in general we were living in, in Bangladesh and I took testimonials from previous survivors and why and how they And then we had a trip to Rakhine in Myanmar as well, but this is now completely closed, completely closed to all outside parties, not even the United Nations gets access to this now. So I made a trip there, and this was a Rohingya village that I came across, which had been completely emptied, and the residents of this village moved in their entirety to these large, oversized concentration camps. And to get into the camps, you have to basically smuggle, you smuggle yourself in, and here's my fixer, bribing some security guards to get me in which was relatively easy at the time, it was for $200, but now it's completely not permitted. And within the camp, you can see some of the conditions that these people live in. It's uh, quite catastrophic. Uh, the conditions are, as you can see, very, very poor. It rains, and it rains all the time. And you have a mixture of human sewage and garbage, which the stench of which, as you can imagine, is extremely, extremely bad. This was my guide, and the security forces patrolling the perimeter of the camp to ensure nobody gets in and nobody gets out. These are just sites of some of the graves, including mass graves like this one, which was a family of uh, nine people that were burnt alive in their house. And the, the security forces put the remains in the back of a pickup truck and dropped them off at the entrance of the camp. And the residents of the camp came and buried them all in this uh, enclosure. So, how did we get here? How did the Rohingya become the most persecuted minority in the world? They are faced over half a century of discrimination. How did this come about? So, central to the, the entire discrimination. Well, first, let me tell you about the Myanmar itself. It's a country that's sandwiched between China, Laos, Thailand, and Bangladesh. And the Rohingya are situated in an area called Sitwe in the Rakhine state, with the capital of which is Sitwe, which borders Bangladesh. About 35 million people in Myanmar, and the estimates of the Rohingya are unknown, but they say it's about 2 million of them. They're unknown because officially they do not exist, and I'll explain that to you in a moment. So, central to the entire discrimination against the Rohingya is this here. 
this word Rohingya, the Myanmar authorities claim that this word Rohingya does not exist. This is a manufactured word. They believe that this word was created, and some of them even bizarrely put a date on it. They say this word was created in March of 1952 by these illegal immigrants that came over from Bangladesh, and they created this word called Rohingya, which means from Rohang, to give themselves a connection to this land. But they are all illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, and they should all go back to Bangladesh. So one of the things I try to do in my book is to examine the veracity of this accusation. And I've got documents from various sources, including this one in, from 1799, and various other documents, Classical Journal 1811. And I also went to the Indian National Archive in New Delhi, where I dug up documents from, from the uh, British time of the British Colonial Office, a report written by uh, a British civil servant called Sir, Sir Charles Patton. In 1826, and in all of these documents, you can see that the term Rohingya is used very clearly, which you probably cannot read from there, but the original layer is on the left hand side, and the, the clear notation is on the right. So, this, this accusation obviously does not stand up to historical scrutiny that this word was created in 1952. The historical documentation and archives clearly debunk that. But despite that, where did this all actually start from? So for that, we need to take a step back into history when the Japanese invaded what was at that time British Burma. This was in, just before the Second World War. The Japanese invaded British Burma. The majority Buddhist population of Burma supported the Japanese invaders, believing that the Japanese are going to be victorious and this is going to lead to swifter independence from the British. Whereas the minority Rohingya population stayed loyal to the British colonial masters. So when the country did become independent in 1948, there was bad blood between the two people. The Buddhists looked at the Rohingya as saying that you did not support us in our time of need. You stayed loyal to the colonial masters and there was bad blood between the two people. The Rohingya was seen as being uh, the fifth colonist within society. But despite that, there was relative calm up until 1962 when there was a coup by the military chief, General Ne Win. General Ne Win, he tried to implement what he called the Burmese Road to Socialism, which was a communist manifesto and it was a complete economic disaster. So he did what a lot of authoritarian dictators do in that situation when things start to go wrong, is that they start to look for scapegoats. They look for scapegoats on whom to blame all the ills of society on. And the Rohingya minority, who look different, who had a different religion, a different language, different skin colour, different features, different culture, and they were already looked at with suspicion, was the perfect minority to start blaming uh, the ills of society on. General David also became much more overtly Buddhist in his outlook. He started to say things like only Buddhists can be loyal citizens of, Myanmar, of Burma, Burma at the time, and everybody else is disloyal and can't possibly be loyal to the state. He passed a number of laws, including the 1974 law, and which eventually culminated in the 1982 Citizenship Act, which stripped all the Rohingya of their citizenship, making them amongst the largest stateless people in the world. This went on up until 1988 when there was an uprising known as the, the, 80, the 8, 8, 8 uprising. And the, this removed General Ne Win from office, but his regime stayed completely intact. So the military regime was still in power. And this, when the regime was still in power, they clamped down the Rohingya even further. And there was a number of massacres and series of massacres. The Rohingya were eventually uh, barred from attending university, barred from standing for election, barred from voting. It was a classic case of discrimination that happened over a period of time. But the most sustained period of violence was in, in, in 2012, when a Rakhine woman was kidnapped and raped. The Rohingya were blamed for this. The extremist Buddhist elements stopped a bus and they killed all the, all the, all the passengers on the bus. And this was, the flames of this was fanned by extremely Buddhist elements. Like this individual here who described himself, he described himself as a Buddhist bin Laden. It's a, as an individual called Ashin Warathu. And individuals like 
General A. Wong, the leader of the Arakan National and National Party, and I'll come back to him shortly. But after these massacres happened in 2012, the UN Special Rapporteur said that nothing has changed for the Rohingya. They have been discriminated against for the last 30 years, and they have continued to be discriminated against. So the aftermath of this violence, we see here the Rohingya were moved into these, forcibly moved into these concentration camps. This is a camp for 140,000 people, 140,000 Rohingya were forcibly placed in these camps, and they only had two options, either you go to the camps or you try to flee on these rickety kind of boats. And when you flee on the boats, you are um, uh, obviously at the peril of the sea, or you're they get sold into the slave trade, to the Thai and the Cambodian slave trade, and Thai and prawn and the fishing trade. It was a very lucrative business for officials in the Thai military to, to sell these Rohingya uh, refugees into the slave trade. So this takes me up to 2016, the most recent wave of violence. There was an organization called the are the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, which undertook a, an attack on a number of security outposts which left about a dozen security officials dead, dead. In response to that, the military of Myanmar clamped down uh, on the Rohingya. They um, invaded a number of villages, including this one here. These are all satellite images obtained by Human Rights Watch. This, for example, is the village of Tukiradan. You can see the satellite imagery before, and this was after. So all the Rohingya houses were burnt down, and then bizarrely the neighboring Buddhist houses were left completely intact. This is the village of Wintet. This is before, and this is after. This is all the extremists burning down there. This is the aftermath. So, in the election of Donald Trump, the Ashes who are active um, uh, believe that Donald Trump is very similar to himself because he's also trying to stop Muslim uh, inv inv invaders coming into his country. And the, the other individual that I mentioned, Dr. A. Mong, actually wrote to Trump thanking him and saying that I'm looking forward to working with you to stopping Islamic radicalization and extremism. So one of the key questions I ask is that if I am making the case that uh, this has been going on for half a century, these are the most persecuted minority in the world and they are the forgotten people, why is this happening now? Why did the Myanmar military wait up until 2017, October 2017 to execute this final solution? Why did they do it before? When you study the genocide, it's actually very interesting is that it is not common it is not uncommon for the perpetrator and the organizer of a genocide to undertake a dry run, to undertake a test run, to see what is going to be the reaction of the international community, what's going to be the reaction of local actors, are we really able to get away with this? So the military in Myanmar undertook a dry run of this entire exercise in 2016. In October 2016, as I demonstrated, they invaded a number of Rohingya villages expelled 140,000 Rohingya, killed tens of thousands of them, raped hundreds of women, and they learned three critical lessons from that exercise. The first lesson they learned was that Aung San Suu Kyi defends the military in public. Aung San Suu Kyi has a shield for all criticism against the military in the public domain. For example, in the BBC's um, uh, uh, Fergo Kyi, BBC journalist Fergo Kyi, said that uh, there is ethnic cleansing going on in your country. She said ethnic cleansing is far too strong a term to use for what is happening. Both sides are equally to blame. Both sides are equally to blame. So drawing a moral comparison between the aggressor and the victim. When the United Nations in March 2017 produced a report to say that 52% of Rohingya women that made it to Bangladesh had been raped, so the majority of them had been raped, she said, this is fake rape. This is fake rape. 
with the UN in the same year, the UN Human Rights Commission called for a full-scale full scale UN Human Rights Commission in Bali. She said, this will not be very helpful, and it was her office that refused to give the visas to the UN to enter the country. So I accept that Aung San Suu Kyi does not control the military, she, has, she does not have control of the military directly, but she is the foreign minister of that country, and she does control who comes and who's, who comes in and out of the country. So this is the first thing that we learn is that Aung San Suu Kyi defends the military in public. She is a shield for all criticism against the military in the public domain. The second thing they learn is that despite all the evidence of ethnic cleansing, genocide, rape camps, villages being burnt down, the military chief, General Win Ong Lee, was still given a VIP invitation to Europe. Austria and Germany literally rolled out a red carpet for him and he toured the armaments factories. And I wrote to both of the ambassadors and I published letters on Huffington Post here saying that the military is now gearing up for a, an, an offensive. This entire region is being militarized and they are gearing up for a final offensive. So this idea that nobody knew what was going to happen is simply not true. And you can see the date on this, this was in May 2017, which was about three months before the actual assault happened. So not only myself, a number of Myanmar watchers knew exactly what was coming around the corner. So that's the second thing they learned, is that despite all the evidence of atrocities, the military chief was still treated like a VIP around the globe. And the third thing that they learned is that the military in Myanmar was very unpopular, which is why they had elections in the first place. They had elections because they were essentially forced to do it. The economy wasn't doing well, and they were forced to have elections. But after this exercise against the Rohingya, the military suddenly became very popular as the defenders of Buddhist values against these hordes whole, of Muslims invading their country. So that's the three things that the military learned from this exercise in 2016, which is why they decided in 2017 that we can actually take this up a couple of notches and execute the final solution and get rid of these people once and for all. So one of the key questions that they asked is about Buddhism. How can surely Buddhists get engaged in such behavior? That certainly does not make sense. But the Buddhism that they follow in Myanmar is not the Buddhism that you and I may be familiar with. It's not the Buddhism of the Dalai Lama, for example. They do not recognize the Dalai Lama. It's a form of Buddhism called Theravada Buddhism, which can, which can not always, but which can be very militant in its nature, which can be very extreme in its nature. So if you go to some of the, if you go to YouTube, you can actually see some of the sermons of these Buddhist monks. One of the most senior monks in Myanmar is an individual called Setagu. And there's a video of him, uh, and it's available on YouTube for anybody to see. He's literally sitting on almost like a throne-like chair in a hall of army officers who are all sitting on the floor. And he's telling them a story about a Buddhist king, a Buddhist king who killed four people. And because he killed four people, he could not sleep at night. He, was, he had a guilty conscience. And these Buddhist monks, because of their insight, they sensed that the king was uneasy and they came to the king in the middle of the night and they said to him that we understand that you're feeling very uneasy because you murdered those four people but you have nothing to fear because those people were not Buddhists and because they were not Buddhists they were only half human. So the implication to the sort of army officers is very clear that anybody who is not a Buddhist is only half human and they believe many of them believe you see here other sermons in which they clearly state that the Rohingya have been reincarnated from snakes and insects. So when you kill them, you're not actually killing humans, you're killing vermin. So what's been the role of the international community in this? This is obviously another very common question. Is why has the international community been so and unable and unwilling to react to this, that this has been building up for over half a century, all the things were there. And there's a number of reasons for this as well. Like, one of the reasons why the Rohingya issue, I believe, has not had much traction is that the Rohingya, when you come across them, when you study them, you realize that these people literally are the lowest of the low that you'll ever come across. 
is hardly anybody amongst them that basic college education. They have all been fishermen, farmers, laborers, or big shackulers. You know, if I were to mention another cause to you, the Palestinian cause, for example, you can name me it's a cause that gets a lot of media coverage. You can name me a few Palestinians. You can name me Yasser Arafat, Mahmoud Abbas, or uh, the supermodel Gigi Hadid. But I bet you not a single one of you can name me a single Rohingya person. Anywhere in the world, you could not name me a single Rohingya person. There is nobody of Rohingya origin in Silicon Valley that can say, I, I'm going to put $5 million of my money from this app that I built to raise as a public awareness campaign for my people. <coughs> there is nobody of Rohingya origin in the BBC or CNN that can take this on as a tech project. There is nobody of Rohingya origin in the British Parliament or the European Parliament or the US Congress. These people literally cannot advocate for themselves locally, let alone globally. There's hardly anybody amongst them with even the most basic education. And just to tell you a very quick story, there's a number of Rohingya refugee families in Chicago, and I met the lady who's teaching them English, and she said to me, she said, oh, it's so difficult to teach these people English because most of them don't know their own language, and most of them have never held a pen. Most have never physically held a pen before. Because this was a systematic and organized campaign by Myanmar, by Burma, over half a century to completely and utterly disenfranchise these people. So that's one of the reasons why the international community has been so slow. These people simply do not appear on any of their radar. People cannot have that human, human connection with them. Another reason why, the second reason why the international community has been so slow to act is because that there's, a, there's a myth being perpetuated and I've met a number of policy makers at the UN, the US, the British Parliament, the LCA, who continuously tell me this, that look, we cannot put too much pressure on Myanmar because, you know, it's a fragile democracy. We understand it's not perfect, but it's an imperfect democracy and it's moving in the right direction. If we put too much pressure on Aung San Suu Kyi and this democratic process, then it might revert to be a military dictatorship, and surely nobody wants that. And this is a myth that has been perpetuated by Aung San Suu Kyi and her supporters. The reality is that the military in Myanmar is in the perfect position at the moment. They are exactly where they want to be. Aung San Suu Kyi managed to get all sanctions lifted off Myanmar. The generals have enriched themselves dramatically. And they have essentially obtained the holy grail of politics, which is power without any accountability. The last thing they want is to remove the civilian leadership, retain control, and invite international sanctions and international scorn upon themselves. So they are actually in a perfect position at the moment, and this is just a myth that's been perpetuated by her and her supporters. And the final reason I believe there's been complete inaction from the West is to do with geopolitics. When President Obama was in office, he visited Myanmar on two occasions. For any country to get a visit from the President of the United States is a very big deal. It's a big deal for that country. The reason why Obama visited is that as Myanmar opens up, this was one of the most closed and most suspicious societies in the world. The US is deeply concerned it's going to fall under the influence of China the sphere of influence of China. The entire Southeast Asia is currently being reconfigured for one purpose, and that is to meet China's insatiable demand for resources. Through the Belt and Road Initiative, that covers almost 60% of the world's population, China is pumping tens of billions of dollars to almost a number of countries in that region, including Pakistan. Access to Myanmar gives access to China to the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean. China has got an ambition to be a global superpower, but before it can become a global superpower, it must become a regional power, and that means keeping its regional nuclear rival India in check. Access to Myanmar gives it access to the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean, and they can avoid the states of Malacca. So you have here geopolitical machinations between the US and China and their nuclear superpowers, and then you insert this minority group called the Rohingya, who nobody's ever heard of, who nobody's ever seen, it does not fit into that equation. This is another reason why there's been complete inaction from the international community. One final point I'd make about Aung San Suu 
talking because this is also a very, very common question about her inability or why is she not speaking out? After all, she's a Nobel laureate. And uh, you know, she's the most famous citizen of Myanmar. I wrote a piece on this in Newsweek uh, last year. It was called How We Were Seduced by Aung San Suu Kyi. And for that piece, I interviewed a dozen people, a dozen people who had known her intimately for decades. Amongst them included the founder of the Free Aung San Suu Kyi campaign, the actual founder of that campaign, and also an individual who used to smuggle papers to her in prison at huge risk to himself, and an Australian member of parliament who um, uh, was the first Westerner to meet with her when she was released from outside. In two hours, he had met with her and he became a lifelong friend. All of them told me on the record that Aung San Suu Kyi is a Burmar Buddhist nationalist. She always has been. There's nothing changed. The fact is that we in the West overlooked it. The reason why we overlooked it is because we in the West have a need. This is our need that we like to have our heroes on a pedestal. We like to have our heroes on a pedestal untarnished. And her story is probably one of the best stories you'll ever hear. Now think about it. The daughter of one of the founding generals of Myanmar placed under house arrest by her father's former colleagues. Now she's out of prison, she's beautiful, she's articulate, Oxford educated, speaks the Queen's English, Nobel laureate. This is fantastic. We love this stuff. This is the stuff we make Hollywood movies out of. Now she's going to go back to her own country, her own backward country, and turn it into our country because she's come and tasted our way of life, our democracy. And we make this mistake over and over again. If you look at examples, most recent examples, if you remember, Saif al Gaddafi the PhD from the London School of Economics who's going to transform his country. You know, then he started threatening genocide on his people. Or a more recent example with uh, Bashar al-Assad, the London trained ophthalmologist who's going to be the great reformer who's been courted by Tony Blair. Now he's turned out to be one of the greatest mass murderers of our time. Or, uh, or Kim Jong-un loves basketball, educated as well as boarding school, loves Disneyland threatening us all with nuclear annihilation now. You know, so we make this mistake over and over again. This is much more to do with us and our need to have our cultural superiority and these backward countries turn into our country that we forget that these, many of these people are actually ideologically committed. And if you look up some of her aunts and Suki's early ratings, it's all there in black and white that her and almost all the elite in Myanmar believe that this is a country for Buddhists. Buddhist only, that just, and it just happens to have these minorities within it, and they don't really belong here. Remember, Myanmar is a country that's been at war with almost every single ethnic minority since independence. These are the longest running civil wars in the world. They do not believe that these people belong in their country. It was interesting when Aung San Suu Kyi came to, before the current crisis erupted, she came to the United States, she met with President Obama, President Obama decided to lift all sanctions of Myanmar. It was interesting that Obama was not the only leader that she met, she also met with Senator Bob Walker, and a number of leaders that she's met have come, up, come to the same conclusion, that she is completely dismissive when you come talk about ethnic, other ethnic minorities in her country. And Bob Walker, in a very uncharacteristic way, issued a very strong statement against her, saying that she witnessed a complete lack of regard for um, uh, other minorities in our country. The leaders of Amnesty International and other senior members of the US Senate and Congress who I met have told me exactly the same thing, that when we bring up this issue, she gets extremely angry that about these minorities and so on, you know, any human rights issues. So what's the future of the Rohingya? Uh, the Rohingya, is, this is now the largest refugee camp in the world. There's about 1.2 million refugees in what is essentially the largest camp. I've been to this camp a number of times, and it's quite astonishing. And I've been to refugee camps all over the globe. I've been to the ones in Syria, Macedonia, East Jordan. And this, is, you, this is like nothing you've seen before. You can literally climb the highest hill, the highest mountain, and look around you, and it's just a sea of humanity that spreads over the horizon. It's an absolutely astonishing astonishing sight. 1.2 million people living in mud and squalor. The probability of them going back to Myanmar was almost next to zero. Myanmar has spent half a century trying to get rid of them. Now that they have gotten rid of them, there's absolutely very little chance that they're going to be taking them back. 
So this dialogue between the Anaman and family of HP Patrick, though, it's a bit of a uh, it's just a bit of a red herring. Myanmar engages in these dialogues to buy time until international tension moves on to the next crisis. And the reality is that the Rohingya have nothing to actually go back to. All the villages have been burned down, they have been bulldozed, the land has been seized, and it's already been redistributed to local Rakhine Buddhists and has been cultivated by them. So I'll just finish there and I'll be happy to take questions. I say this is because I wrote another piece 
Informal Policy Magazine, which, which, I, which I recommend that you read. It's called the uh, Costly King for the Whooping Job. And the reality is, is that if you allow one genocide to happen, you are opening the door to many others. The Myanmar authorities, and there's considerable evidence for this now, is that they have been significantly important that we have managed to get rid of this population in its entirety. And now they are turning their attention on to other minorities, Christian minorities in the north, the like Kashin, the Shan, and the Klein, and now facing the same sort of treatment. And the two divisions that were deployed to rid the country of the Rohingya, charge, Division F in 99, also known as the tip of the spear, have now been deployed to the north against those other minorities. And this is, this is the problem, is that if you allow one generation to happen, you will certainly open the door to many, many others. Okay, I saw another hand here. <coughs> uh, Chad Long, you said that uh, normally with these genocides you see a test run before, or a dry run before they happen. Was that something we saw in Germany before that happened? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll take that one first and then I'll turn it over to Z. Um, if you read the book Burning Tigers uh, by a scholar in the Canadian genocide, um, in many ways what the Germans consider as evidentiary basis for a trial or not was the, the actions of the Turkish government in the Middle East during World War I. But it was also the genocide that took place in the German colony in Africa. Yes. Yes. So, okay. so Chris, you yeah, have some, some background about uh, it. Dr. Reeves does as well, so I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, but I, I will tell you that I spent uh, a great deal of my master's time in the archives in Auschwitz uh, and in some places in Central Europe. And there seems to be a strong evidentiary basis, um, honestly, I would say that it's been strongly suggested that those two events taken sort of two trial rounds um, for how this I would <coughs> further call your attention to two other events. So six weeks after Hitler came to power, um, the high concentration was <coughs> over. The first thing they went after was the press. Um, you know, okay, and the idea was is first we need to silence to sit. And they, they broke it down into a, a fairly significant um, thoughtful prosecution of how they were going to Use Dachau um, to sign this to sit. If you then flash forward to November of 1939, if you go to the Anglo University of Cairo, um, on the second floor you will find a plaque that most people don't know was there. But the plaque said it commemorates the day that all of the PhD faculty members were awarded to kind of a convocation held by the SS. Um, and thanks for showing up, putting trucks and shipped off uh, to concentration camps that were killed. So the idea was is that we're going to use the exact same systematic process that we used in Munich and Dachau to now export uh, as we come into the general government of both occupied Poland as well as general government of Poland. So my, my research and my experience um, tends to cause me to believe in no uncertain terms that, that yes, there were very precise evidentiary trial runs for the Germans and the Nazi party and how they set that up. And if you look at the evolution of the Holocaust, um, really from 1933 into the laws of 1936, the Christian of 1938, and then the Polish campaign um, followed by a Barbarossa. There, there is, in fact, uh, a key to building and breaking down into very precise, not letter like because there's still humans that make decisions or can use the information. Um, but you can definitely outline the steps of decisions. Uh, and in fact, how those decisions were modified over time as they went about carrying out those policies. Yeah. So, well, one thing that uh, you know, um, uh, we need to understand with genocide is that it never happens all of a sudden. It actually takes a long time to build up to it. And uh, if you look at almost all genocides, you know, the dehumanization process until you can uh, dehumanize somebody sufficiently that you're willing to kill them en masse 
It actually takes a long time to build up. So in many of these cases, the signs are almost there. And if you look at cases, whether it's in Bosnia, Rwanda, or even the Khmer Rouge, this process actually took quite a bit of time. And uh, it's very common for them to undertake you know, test runs, perpetrators and organizers to undertake various kinds of test runs and test out the waters to see if they're going to get away with it. Uh, I, I'll add one more thing to this. Um, if you take a look at the changes desired in social structure by the government of Bismarck, um, especially in the partition of Poland, um, the, the, the cult of Kampf, you know, struggle with the culture, um, exists. And so, for example, Poles and that part of Poland were forbidden to learn Polish. They were forbidden to learn the right Polish. Um, and so you might think, well, gosh, that's sort of interesting, okay, Kultikov. Um, until you realize, why do you think Hitler gave his book Mein Kampf? Okay, it was a direct historical allusion to, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it. So to further reinforce the point, these things very rarely happen in isolation. Rather, they tend to develop over time. And in fact, the whole point of the conference is, how do you know when is the tipping point? Where do you make the decision? Jan Karski had himself smuggled not once but twice in Auschwitz. Uh, Auschwitz won the first time, Auschwitz two buck an hour the uh, second time. Uh, escaped both times after the second time. He managed to escape the Rocky Pike and eventually came to the White House to brief uh, Justice Frankfurter and Hotel Roosevelt. And after telling the President and Justice Frankfurter that he had seen, Justice Frankfurter, who was not a Superman, said, I can't believe what you're telling me. And Jan Karski was sort of protest. With Justice Frankfurter said, I'm not saying that you're lying. What I'm saying is I'm incapable of believing what you are telling me. And there's a very keen difference there. So the people who perpetrate these things, they aren't stupid. And they know that if they can get in front of the capacity to absorb and still understand information, they can carry out the policies that they want to. Again, not because anybody is lying, but because people are incapable of actually so does that fully answer your question? Thank you. Okay, I think I saw the fellow sitting next to you with a question. Yes, sir. My name is Andres Howard. I'm from the Chilean Navy. I have one question concerning the Rohingyas. I had no idea, no background in here. But I see there's two different things. One is the political issue, so that you would say that there hasn't been a strong um, international as you mentioned, there was not a big issue in the international community to go against this genocide. But on the other side, you have also a humanitarian crisis, where my question goes in, do you see a regional, because in the UN could be argued that at this time, what, they, what is the real importance of the UN, what way it's going, do you see a country like India taking control of the region and become a real, taking a, a leading role in both sides, the political and the humanitarian crisis? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, India, um, uh, under the leadership of uh, Prime Minister Modi, is actually uh, turning even more right wing, you know, as you're probably aware, you know, um, uh, with the Hindutva movement. And uh, India has about 30,000 Rohingya refugees that have been there for quite some time, you know, many decades. And they are now in the process of trying to expel them and try to get rid of them. And this is always catering to the, the extreme right kind of <coughs> mob in India. And uh, the difficulty they have is that obviously they have nowhere to expel them to. You know, Myanmar doesn't want them back, and uh, you know, no other country is actually in the region so will keep them either. Um, uh, whether India, uh, the, the whole challenge of the ASEAN country in Southeast Asia, because China is such a huge and powerful dominant player. And China has absolutely no interest in the, in the Rohingya issue whatsoever in trying to resolve it. And they themselves, as you're probably aware, are clamping down their own, on their own weaker population, the Muslim population, and, uh, to such an extent that uh, it's actually quite astonishing at the scale of what is happening with the Uyghurs in the Xinjiang. And so, this is one of the challenges you have. Is that there's almost no leadership on this issue at all in, the, in Southeast Asia. And uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, the Rohingya certainly don't appear on anybody's radar as a priority. 
you know, uh, there we've seen as much more of a, as of a nuisance of these people turning up in boats uh, to the coast of Malaysia, Thailand, and Cambodia uh, than anything else. You know, so it's, I, I don't expect any of the countries in the region to actually take initiative on this, on this issue. Zee so makes a really good point when you talk about China. Um, I was in Western China this past summer. The estimates, reliable estimates are hard to come by, um, but the estimates are that it's somewhere between 1.5, perhaps as many as 2.5 million Uyghurs in concentration camps um, in Western China. Uh, if you haven't seen the new play butter, um, if you want to get an idea of what a dystopian state looks like, head out towards Western China. Um, it's, it's really pretty amazing in terms of um, artificial intelligence and the scanning that's done that's kind of everyone and everything. And, uh, and, uh, so I think, like the Rohingya, how, how can we go and say about the Sinhalese? Well, when it's from Western China, if you think in Beijing and Shanghai, it's about a trend of a thousand miles west. It's really, really cool to get into. So if you're a reporter, if you're an academic, if you're from the UN, just getting there. collectively are grateful for the eye-opening and poignant, tragic uh, situation that you've uh, described. And of course, we're sort of depressed. You've boxed out all of the possible uh, optimistic scenarios. So I would just like to raise one, since the one asset they have is their membership in the Muslim community. And there are some Gulf states which do have labor needs and they do get them from Pakistan. I mean, I'm thinking of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, can you give me a little bit of optimism that the community of Muslims and the need for labor, even uneducated and uh, not trained labor, could have any hope that they might uh, accept Rohingya uh, refugees? That's a, that's a great question. But unfortunately, I'm going to have to dash any hope that you may have. Uh, the Gulf countries, as, as, as you're aware, you know, uh, the majority of the population, the laborers, are all from Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Philippines, and so on. They, you know, in some countries, they make up 80 to 85 percent of the actual population they can cover. Now, one of the reasons why they are not keen on, they would not be keen on taking on the Rohingya is because when these laborers come into their countries, uh, you know, their passports are taken off them. In those countries, whether it's Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, or Qatar, or anybody else, is finished with them, you will send them back. And on many occasions, they send them back prematurely. Uh, but the Rohingya, where exactly will they send them back to? You know, then this is a real challenge for those countries. These countries, are, the Gulf countries, are extremely sensitive to uh, people coming into their country and uh, having any sort of rights whatsoever. You know, so we have no way to send the Rohingya back to, and essentially, they have to settle your country and this is something that they're not very keen on. And it's very interesting because one of the questions I always, you know, not, I, I don't think enough people ask is that in the Syrian situation, for example, you had a, 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 a war that's still ongoing and you had, uh, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of refugees pouring into Europe, pouring into Christian Europe, whereas literally the neighboring countries who have immense wealth, who have immense space, most of it's empty desert, an immense capacity to build mega infrastructure projects at huge speed. They are taking in zero refugees. 
Sergei Rivia, for example, was taken at new refugees for Salaval. They claimed that they have a loan, some Serbians to almost pay their welcome, but they were taken at new refugees for Salaval. Now, why is that the case, you would ask? Them. The reason for that is relatively simple. The Saudi population themselves are poorly educated, the youth are poorly educated, they've been living on subsidies for most of their life. Now, the Crown Prince is trying to reform the economy and trying to get more youth into these jobs rather than giving them to foreigners. They know for certain that when they allow the Syrians into their country, Syrians who are educated and entrepreneurial, who speak the language and have the same religion, and they give them refugee status, and according to the UN, refugee status eventually leads to citizenship. Within one generation, these people will take over the whole country, and their own population is poorly, poorly educated and essentially lazy. And so they have a very, very clear policy that workers coming to our country, whether it's from the US or whether it's from the UK or Europe, they come for a short period of time to make money, many, many occasions tax fee money, but they want no stake in society. When you have no stake in society, you don't want any change because your children aren't going to walk there. And you go back to your own country, and that's the way they like it. They don't want anybody overstaying their welcome. Thank you. 
there's an entire actor, and this is something unfortunately the US have been really on the back foot about. They have, they have no idea how to, how to counter this kind of misinformation coming out from, uh, from, 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 from Russia. And it's the same case in many of these situations where the Myanmar authorities aren't as sophisticated, in, uh, but there are many other situations in which you have sophisticated operators. Syria is a very good example of this, and there's so many people still believe. You know, ISIS is an American creation, or the White House is uh, either, and so on. And this is all part of the disinformation campaign, so it actually works in both ways. Well, let, let me add something that you know, what's what I call intellectual chaff, um, you know, or in, information saturation. So part of the challenge is, is I've seen this clearly that how do you get to a decision? Stories were told when uh, Jaczynski and Mendes were in the Carter White House. Um, Carter was very famous for reading from the top of the inbox now. And they would both fight each other to see who could be the last guy to put a memo in his box so that their memo would get in it first, which meant you know, the first pre Roosevelt snowflake would come back out of the old walls. And there were actually stories of the two of them like, trying to hide in the bathroom. And I can't move the memoir around so it would be the first thing the president saw. Um, part of the problem is there's an awful lot that has to be done to even get an issue in front of us very seriously. Um, that's why I started with that picture up there of you know, President Obama I was first happy in the White House where he was just sitting there by himself, you know, thinking about what are the decisions that I have to make and the other ones that somebody I think another key part of it is, you know, is an educational construct that teaches, especially our teenagers, um, to distinguish between, as you put it, what the Kardashian is doing today and what's happening you know, in the city camp today. You know, one of those may be interesting, but the other one's really important. Um, in, in teaching people to be discerning consumers of information. And the last thing I've had is you, you can go on Amazon.com and you can look up the uh, Mass Atrocity Response Operations Handbook, uh, which was by a group of people at Harvard uh, in 2009 2010. Um, so I don't get any money from it, so, so it's not a problem. Um, but what we did was is we tried really, 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 really hard to figure out what realistic, pragmatic response operations. Be. So that instead of walking into the situation, you know, I have uh, no idea Mr. President, you can walk in and say, well, I've got four options here, none of which are perfect, but at least I've got options that I've got a place to start from. Um, the uh, PKSOI down in Carlisle, in the College, which is a great place, uh, did the mass atrocity uh, prevention response operations, so NAPRO. Both of these you can also download those PDFs. Um, you know, the one for BKSOI, I know you can download that. I don't know if you can get it in print, but you can download it out. The one from Harvard, you can buy if you wish to. Uh, it's designed to fit in your cargo pocket. Okay, it's smaller than an MRE. Um, I designed it that way because I'm usually the last chief and I know it doesn't fit in the cargo pocket. It doesn't get in the cargo pocket. Um, but the idea is that. You're not telling decision makers what to do, but you are telling them is what realistic response options might look like and what you can do with them. And I think that's the key I'd like to tease out here, is it still comes down to that human who has to make the decision. But if you work on the policy, the doctrine, the preset options, um, you know, as we like to call them plans on the shelf, which we haven't been confused with the off on the shelf, uh, then you can at least have some options to consider. And that makes it easier for the political decision makers to muster the will and, and put the people behind it. And that's why I started off mentioning you know, uh, preservation of the English. I mean, he made a decision and he announced it from the Oval Office of Brian Conn. That's about as much political will as you can get. All right? 18 dead guys, you know, uh, 18 months later, a different president, and he said he not muster that political will. Okay? And the results of that. Okay, so does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, so over here on the wall. Good afternoon. My name is Lieutenant Commander Holloway of Nixon with the U.S. Navy. I had a very unique opportunity a few years ago to go to Burma, to Myanmar, before the Rohingya crisis sort of culminated. And two things 
struck me uh, while we were engaged with their Navy, for some Navy to Navy activity, and they talked about the, uh, how they really depended on their partnerships with China, which you highlighted a little bit in the relationship. And then also in Rangoon, just uh, the, the rapid development from the Chinese and, and also from other ASEAN countries. So despite some of the sanctions and the limitations from the West, countries in Asia, like, as we all know, China has sort of an amoral uh, foreign policy when it comes to helping their neighbors, particularly Burma, because it's so strategic. And so this development is occurring, and the country, they're not all parts of the, the, the government, are directly connected to the army, and the Navy is a great example of that. And they did and wanted to have a, a greater partnership with us, but unfortunately that's not possible at the moment. But I wonder, with that said, that if countries are going to engage with the Myanmar government, and the West is going to limit their engagement or impose uh, sanctions, if we, if we can't have dialogue with the government, is, I wonder if that makes things worse in the long run if the West breaks down that dialogue and other uh, areas of the, of the world, like China and, and ASEAN, have the dialogue, then what, what can we what can we leverage? And I understand the need for sanctions to do that. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a great question, and you're absolutely right. You know, one of the, the sanctions that the West has imposed for no effect whatsoever, you know, the US and the uh, you know, announced that they will be suspending military exercises of Myanmar, military exercises which were almost non-existent, and any slack that was even produced was given up by, by China, so it didn't have much effect. This is why I, I, I believe, and I, I, I'm always in complete favor of having some sort of dialogue, but dialogue, I, I believe, in this situation, will be seen as much more of this. This is why I feel very strongly the course of action from the International Criminal Court to bring identify and bring some of those perpetrators and organizers of these atrocities to justice. It may not happen within my lifetime, <coughs> but certainly identifying them. And this is something that they actually fear deeply. They actually deeply fear that they will not be able to travel and their holdings in Singapore and in Dubai and Switzerland will be frozen and they'll be under a restriction. But I think it will also send a very clear message. And the, the actual architects of this genocide are actually very well known. You know, many of them make public statements, bizarrely, you know, on their own Facebook pages of how they're going to claim the land of these Bengali immigrants and the, this is an unfinished solution. So, and then, they make public statements themselves, including the army chief. You know, so uh, so I, I believe very strongly that the uh, action of the International Criminal Court uh, you know, and, uh, is much more sends a much stronger signal than any sort of sanctions in, in this particular situation. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Carolyn Sula-Logue, an adjunct professor of African Studies at the War College. Um, I have a question for each of you. Uh, the first is, is there any role, what, what role, if any, do you see for UN peacekeeping forces uh, to play any kind of role in future, shall we say, uh, situations like this? And a question for Dr. Ibrahim. Um, Islam is the religion that is supposed to be the religion of violence and aggression, and uh, it has that bad reputation, as you will know. Uh, Buddhism, on the other hand, has a reputation for being a religion of peace and non intervention and live and let live. It is your opinion, is this the first case of Buddhist nationalism that has turned to such uh, extreme measures? So in, 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 terms, in terms of the role of the UN, you know, I've, I've had quite a lot of interaction with the UN since, uh, since this crisis started. I've been a number of times and met with various ambassadors and officials and, and uh, briefing them and you know, uh, getting to the process. And uh, the UN is very heavily criticized and I've always, I've always been a big fan of the UN even as necessary. But through, through this entire process, I've lost a lot of confidence in the UN. You know, I believe firmly in the UN agencies UNHCR, the IOM, and so on, I think they do an absolutely critical and uh, very important job. But the Security Council and its complete dysfunctionality has become very evident to me. It is really just a platform for horse training between great powers and uh, how they can achieve each other. They have one position one day and the next day they have completely opposite position. And in many respects, I believe it also has a hindering effect 
and, and be fake to first of all legitimate legitimize action which I which may in many cases be illegitimate and uh, but in many cases to essentially hinder any sort of progress or uh, any sort of solution because it's not being approved by the Security Council. Um, uh, so I, this this has been an eye opening experience for me having to deal with the UN particularly with the Security Council and I've seen its dysfunctionality uh, close up. Uh, regarding the Buddhist situation, you know, I, I'm not a Buddhist expert in any form. The only Buddhism I've been exposed to when I was researching my book. But I remember in the early stages of my book, I did speak to an Oxford scholar who was, who, was, who, was a, who was a Buddhist expert. And he said, if you look statistically, and, uh, and if you look at actually by proportion, the Buddhists have actually been amongst the most violent people in history, much more so than the Muslims or the Jews or the Christians, which is very interesting because there's always been a perception that we have. But I think this also indicates to us that there is no ideology that is immune from these kinds of extremist elements. You know, you know, to say one ideology is more extreme than another. It's, uh, and remember, the most violent ideologies of the 20th century were the non-religious ones, you know, communism and fascism, that killed more people than anybody else. So this is, uh, this is um, uh, I think, much more to do with human capacity than it is with that to any particular ideology. Uh, I've, I've worked with the UN in several different capacities and places, so uh, the answer to your question is yes or no. Um, the UN does a great job of bringing resources and attention to places that might be otherwise be It also does a really good job of uh, putting a food or a food on um, realizing that we're all human and we're all courts. Uh, you, you can get into places and you can have information and influence involved in presence and effect um, that might dissuade the people from, from continuing acts of violence. Uh, that being said, I was in Israel a couple of summers ago with my family and understanding of one being an outpost uh, in the Columbia Heights, where I was as a lieutenant like 30 years ago, and it's the exact same custody at all, the exact same people still going to be each other. Uh, but I, I work with you in northern Iraq, I work with Cambodia, I work with the Balkans, I work with the Central Africa. Um, they can do some really good things. Probably the best thing we can do is get somebody who's a P5 member who brings actual teeth uh, to the genocide prevention. Okay? Uh, we have some folks who do a great job of contributing forces. But they contribute forces that show up in airplanes that you drive with nothing but the clothes on the back. Sometimes they have flip flops, you have to put them in boots. They don't have any weapons. Well, they're glad to be here because you and they beat the heck out of whatever they are getting paid at all. Um, but part of the reason I, I emphasize the capable, commanded, and coordinated force structure is that you, you've got to have folks that are pretty sophisticated in executing operations. And I, I, I walk down dusty roads separating people from fighting. Um, that is not without risk. Uh, Although the majority of these are all still in line, I have to go to somebody else. Uh, you know, so you, you can really count on the UN to do some things really, really well. But if you really want to get somewhere fast, if you want to be decisive, if you want to be capable, um, the last time I worked on this in, in uniform, we figured there were about seven countries in the world. And uh, that's, that's a pretty short list. You have Lyft, you have to have Intel. Global communications that have sustained. Um, you've got to have commanders that are not commissioned officer and company officer level who can make some really difficult decisions about very, very ambiguous coordinated ethical and legal sort of action. And they have to be really fast. Um, so the answer is just that. One more. Uh, I'm told we have time for one last question, so who wants to get it? Maybe a question or comment. First of all, thank you very much for those excellent presentations and answers to the questions and the terrific. Um, I, I wanted to address my our Israeli officer friend. I was recently uh, working with uh, several African officers and we were talking about Yemen. And the question was posed, well, how come the United States doesn't just go in and, and solve the problem and deal with that? And 
you know, all the answers that you gave are the answers that you give back on political world, etc. But I'm starting to come to a, a thought, which is I, I don't think it's so easy to dismiss the United States under this administration backing away from a leadership role in the world. Um, and the United States, at least at, at least a significant portion of it, um, seeing the world in a different way. Uh, Anti-immigration, for example. You know, there's a, there's a large percent of Americans don't want immigrants in the United States, which historically, that's who we are, Statue of Liberty. And so I, I'm struggling myself, and I deal with high school students all the time back in front of education. You know, they've got this phone at their hand, they've got the information at their fingertips. If, if, if you ask them who the Rohingya are right now, they have no idea, but they know who Kim Kardashian is. It's not taught in schools. It's not what the AP courses drive you towards. And so I just, I, I, I'm, I mean, I've got young kids, you know, I'm trying to teach them, but I'm, I'm just very nervous about where we're headed as a country when we deal and talk about these types of issues. So I know that's more of a comment than a, than a question. I just really, very much appreciate the, all of your comments and, and I have to Uh, in administrative, they have to get this out of the way first. I am a graduate assistant 
institution. And when I went here, um, the Navy football team was on a roll. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Okay, good. <laughs> but it's really good to be back. And I, I, I love this place. And I'm glad you're back for it. And I want to thank Hyatt very much for the invitation to come back um, and, and, and have an opportunity to speak here. Um, Commander General Staff College has a significant uh, investment in gem site studies. Uh, and, and for us to be able to collaborate with the uh, Naval War College is, is, of course, a great thing. We can leverage uh, our, our composite capability. Um, we do have at the, at the Staff College a, a seminar that we offer uh, on, uh, on genocide studies and mass atrocities. My priority, all my, all my, uh, my, my dissertation work is on uh, uh, legal aspects of the Holocaust. So this is a little different. This is a, we're a little broader when we do our seminar. Our seminar touches history of genocide, it touches economics, it touches actors, specifically perpetrators, witnesses, bystanders, and victims. Uh, we, we do uh, quite a bit on the law. Uh, we talk about uh, different stages of genocide. Uh, we talk about Maro and Macro, as, as, as Don brought up earlier. Uh, we talk about security sector reform, uh, post-conflict security sector reform. Uh, and we do, we do some case studies. And so what this, um, this, this seminar, this conference has offered an opportunity to do is, is uh, build another case study um, uh, that, that I can offer the students. And I'm going to test drive it on, on this audience. So let me know what you think. Uh, but our mission uh, in, as, as educators in the professional military uh, education uh, business is to, is to get our, our, our young officers to be able to think critically so that they can create options for their commanders. This is something that Don touched on earlier. Uh, and I will purloin his, his seven decision points. I thought those were very good. Uh, and we, we can apply those. Good, good staff officers have to be able to offer their commanders options that have decision points, at which point you can, you can take your course of action to the next level. Uh, so what today we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the, at the situation in Bangladesh. Uh, and and, and I, I've said this is kind of a simmering violence. And what I mean by that is, is uh, I had, uh, uh, one, of, one of the charters of this, uh, this event was to, to look at slow, uh, slow generating genocides. Uh, and, and as, uh, as Azim talked about, uh, the Rohingya genocide is operating under the radar for the most part. It pops up now and again, but it, 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 it's just it's simmering, if you will. And that's similar to what's going on at a lower level of intensity uh, in, in Bangladesh at this time. Uh, and I want to stipulate that as I'm going to talk about quite a bit about uh, Muslim and Hindu violence uh, today. Uh, but I want to stipulate up front that there are other areas in the region where the opposite is true. There, there's enough hate to go around everywhere. Um, my research is in the area of mass atrocity in the law, and this case is interesting because it denies an easy answer. As many slow genocides do, they deny uh, the ability to easily assign a category. Um, I would offer ethnic cleansing as an option, which doesn't have a legal standing, yet folks seem to know what ethnic cleansing is all about. But ethnic cleansing has a geographical context more than anything else. And uh, less extermination. Extermination is a second order effect of ethnic cleansing. But the idea is to purify the land first and foremost. And we'll see some of that here. Um, there has been a, a, a long standing history of persecution of, of uh, Hindus uh, as the minority in Bangladesh. Uh, and it goes from a simmer to a full boil from time to time. Uh, it is cyclical, uh, but it seems to have no instinct. Uh, and it's durable, it's cruel, uh, and it's the it, 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 as cruel as the treatment of humans has been, it does not rise to the level of genocide in, in many people's opinions. And we'll, we'll walk through that process here and, and decide for ourselves. Uh, to inform our, our discussion today, though, I'm going to have to spend some time uh, creating some background, uh, much as the team did for the, for the, the Myanmar Burma Rohingya uh, background. Uh, and we'll look at that, and we'll look at the, uh, the events of the region following World War II. Uh, we're then going to examine those uh, events against the 1948 United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. In other words, does this rise to the threshold of genocide? And then 
finally, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to compare this against Dr. Gregory Spann's 10 stages of genocide, uh, which is a tool that we use. Uh, Dr. Spann <coughs> has a website called Genocide Watch, uh, and this is a tool that we use uh, at the staff college to help our officers understand uh, the, the uh, development and process of, of the genocide. Um, just some basic terminology before we get started here. Uh, until 1971, Bangladesh was in fact East Pakistan, uh, and that had only been the case since 1947. Um, before that, it was part of the uh, Indian Empire. The partition of India, uh, as with most decolonizing efforts, was fraught with problems and violence. Uh, the animus that existed between the Hindu and the Muslim populations in India was significant, uh, and the British attempted to ameliorate that condition by separating the two populations into two separate independent entities, India and Pakistan. Uh, unfortunately, Pakistan, Pakistan, as you can see, was designed by a committee uh, to split into West Pakistan and East Pakistan, separated by hundreds of miles of, of, of not-so-friendly folks in India. So that when we, again, the decolonization problems that ensued. Uh, over time, uh, friction grew between East Pakistan and West Pakistan uh, because the West Pakistanis considered the East Pakistanis not energetically Muslim enough. They were too secular, uh, and, and they, uh, the folks from the West Pakistan were the dominant. Uh, they, they controlled the government of the, the country, East and West. Uh, and, and they were not unhappy. They were not happy at all about uh, the way things were developing in the East. Uh, there is a mass migration that occurs when this split happens. About 10 million people move. Um, there were a lot of people that died, mostly in the Punjab, and that's up in the, in the West, and that's the last we'll talk about that. But once it split, the result was this culturally, ethnically, regionally, geographically divided Pakistan. And, and the question we all ask when we see that is what could go wrong? What could have been actually? Um, this is, the, this is a, a map of Bengal on your left, of, of uh, the, the Bengal Presidency, as it was called by the British. Uh, and I'm going to get the pointer to work. I'm not licensed. Basically, this is, this right here is current day, uh, what you see over here. Bangladesh. This reverts back to India, and a good part of this up here does as well. Um, uh, the, the colony that you see on the left there uh, was split into two, but these folks all understood themselves to be ethnically Bengali, culturally Bengali. Predominantly Muslim area across the board. Uh, when the split happened, many of the Hindus moved to the west, and many of the Muslims moved to the east. So there was a big demographic split. Current uh, split of population uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Bangladesh today is about 89% Muslim, about 9.8% uh, uh, Hindu, and then there's a, there's a variety of other small, very small in there. So following the partition, West Pakistan was decisively more powerful than East Pakistan, as I already mentioned, and they were also more aggressively Islamic. East Pakistan was viewed as too secular and too tolerant of non-believers, uh, especially the Hindu, because they were the most significant population. And the powers of it, the powers of being Islamabad created Islamic groups in the East to foment unrest. In East Pakistan, devoutly and aggressively Muslim groups uh, tied with the West Pakistan, tied to West Pakistani uh, sponsorship, tried to purify the state through oppression. Uh, the violence would again come and go; it would cool. But I, I list a number of significant uh, events here uh, that, that you can see. Uh, one of the things is that Hindu, Hindu religious events, uh, their temples, etc. They started to see some attacks in '47. Uh, the, the ability of Hindus to publicly uh, worship was prescribed for a time in 1948. A number of massacres in, in the late 40s, early 50s. 
and it just kind of it just kind of trundles along like this. And it's it's interesting because the governments would go, you get a very uh, a very aggressively uh, pro-Islamic government, in it, and then they would be balanced several years later by a more moderate government. And this back and forth continued, and there were various spikes of violence, etc. Uh, and then in 1971. Uh, there was this horrible, horrible event that many of us remember. Well, I'm not sure it's all good, but I remember it. And uh, <laughs> there, there was a genocide in Bangladesh. And the West, um, the East Pakistan decided they wanted to be independent of West Pakistan and form their own nation. Uh, many bad things happened. Um, and there were three million casualties in there. That's the official. Uh, Bangladesh number, not a lot of argument from the UN or other authorities on that number. Uh, importantly here, there was, a, there was a significant systematic rape campaign. This is important because it shows up here for the first time as a systematic campaign, and it doesn't go away, it hasn't gone away yet today. It still exists in the country. Um, but at this, this particular event caused another 8 million Hindus to, to uh, to uh, export themselves to, to India to escape the violence. Following the genocide of 71, uh, again, sort of, it, it kind of percolated along. There were some interesting developments in, in, in the immediate period following the, the, uh, the genocide. The Constitution was written such that uh, it called for a secular socialist nation that was not to be an Islamic nation because if you recall now the East is, is throwing off the what they consider to be the oppressive yoke of the, of the West, West Pakistan, which was trying to, to push uh, Sharia law, etc. on East Pakistan and they were rejecting it. Uh, but it, it, they, again, they percolate along in the 80s. Uh, there's always a low level of violence. It's kind of like a low noise in the background. Of course, none of this hits our newspapers. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, it started to kick up a little bit. And in early 92, we started to see an organized campaign of two things. We're going to destroy Hindu places of worship, and we're going to destroy the populations through rape. We're going to occupy uh, wombs. That's what we're going to do. And so the anti-Hindu Hindu violence uh, kicked off, <coughs> and we started to see more mass immigration. An interesting uh, statistic I read as I was researching this is that uh, the net population growth of the Hindus in Bangladesh for the last 10 years is negative. Not because of low birth rates, they enjoy very robust birth rates, but because they immigrate uh, to avoid the violence. In 2006, the U.S. Commission on uh, International Religious Freedom issued a very uh, condemning report uh, that did get some, some, some publicity and, and, uh, and caused a good bit of anger in, in amongst the, uh, the uh, Bengali Nationalist Party, uh, which caused another wave of oppression. Uh, in, in, the, in 2012, we see additional violence come up. Uh, and then in 2013, uh, something good happened and something bad happened. The good thing that happened was uh, the International Criminal Court indicted several of the Muslim leaders of the genocide of 1971. You would look at that as progress. This is a good thing. Um, the problem was, um, as soon as they were indicted, the Jamaat al-Islam, the, the big uh, Islamic party in Bangladesh, began another rioting campaign of looting, temple destruction, home destruction, similar to what Azim showed us in, in, uh, in uh, Robert Hain State, uh, where they just destroy the specific homes. Um, and then, the, again, we're starting to see abduction and, and systematic rape, uh, where, where women are, are, are abducted and, and, and raped, and, and similar to the, the conditions in, in Bosnia, they're not permitted to die until they give birth, in many cases. Uh, then, they can, then they're disposable after they give birth. Uh, the second wave of Hindu violence comes when the, uh, the, the sentences are handed down, and this was an even more violent reaction to, to what was uh, happening in the state. So what you see, what we see here in going on in Bangladesh is a wave, it's just this quiet wave, if you're experiencing it, it's quiet. We're not hearing about it in the Western media too often. We do hear about recent things. There are recent events. There have been a bunch of students that, that have been arrested 
uh, and beaten and imprisoned, but because two students were run over by a bus and they rioted, they said, you need to make the streets safe. Well, and when, they, when the students started rioting, one of the things that the uh, Bangladeshi government wants to do is shut down all, all uh, criticism of the government. And so as these students riot, they're, they're thrown in jail and they are disappeared. We're seeing quite a bit of that. Uh, so what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get after here is in the spirit of this, of this meeting is that this idea that there's this simmering anti-Hindu violence that is being perpetrated with impunity because it's invisible. It doesn't rise to anybody's attention level. So let's take a look at this against the, uh, the definition of genocide, the only legal definition of genocide that exists, and that's the one that's uh, in the 1948 UN Convention um, that, it, that stipulates that genocide is a crime. And the, the, uh, the convention contains 19 articles. It was approved in 1948 and is commonly called the 48 Convention, but it didn't enter into force until 1950. Uh, important for this discussion is Article 2, because it, 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 does, it does two things for us. First of all, it, um, it defines the four targeting criteria. And these are uh, national, nationality, nationality, ethnicity, racial, or religious. So if you are targeted for destruction in whole or in part because of your nationality, ethnicity, race, or religion, then you are guilty of genocide by this definition. And then what constitutes, what are, the, what are the five modalities? Well, they are murder, killing of the group, causing serious harm, mental or bodily harm, a little bit more difficult to define some of those aspects, deliberately inflicting upon groups conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction. We probably talked about starvation earlier was one of those key things. Uh, the Armenian uh, driving the folks into the desert is a good example of that. Imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. And that could be a number of things, but systematic rape campaigns generally fall under that rubric. And then finally, forcibly transferring children to another group. And, and probably the two best exemplars of that are uh, Bosnia and Armenia. Uh, but at the, end, at the end of the day, what we have to remember is that only those, only those, those are the only four reasons uh, identities uh, that, that will comprise a formal uh, charge of genocide. Of course, the first thing my students ask is, well, how come political opponents and dissidents are not part of that definition? And the answer to that, of course, is because a member of the committee of the Soviet Union uh, refused to allow uh, political uh, folks, uh, political dissidents to be included in the definition. As an aside, that's a very good chance that if the Soviets hadn't objected to that, the United States would have. So you know, it's just one of those things to go out of there. But those are the identities. And so now let's take a look at Bangladesh against, oh, these are the, these are the crimes that are punishable. I included Article 3 just because it's, um, it's uh, you know, it, it, the detail it gives you on what, it's not just the actual perpetration of the crime. The conspiracy, which is a peculiarly American, uh, those of you who've read about Nuremberg you know that this caused the tribunal incredible heartburn because the only ones that use conspiracy are the Americans to a lesser extent the British. But once you, the, the French and the Soviets just could not understand why we try conspiracy. Incitement to commit, and of course the, the most famous of that is the Rwandan radio station operators, uh, attempt to commit uh, genocide and then complicity in genocide, which was the, which is the one that uh, the stipulation that generally gets the leadership of the country. And what I'm going to contend uh, here, and I'll subject to your comments as we follow up here, uh, is that um, if you look at the, at the, uh, the Hindu persecution at the hands of the, of the, uh, of the uh, Bengali Muslims in Bangladesh, that uh, the, the four or the five criteria are in fact achieved. Members are killed. Members are caused seriously by bodily harm. Uh, again, I'm back to uh, the systematic rape when I talk about de deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction. 
and then imposed the measures imposed to prevent births within the group. And, and that again falls under the systematic rape as well. And to a lesser degree, the starvation has been imposed. So the second model we'd like to look at here as we, as we look at the, the Bangladesh genocide, or Gregory Stan's 10 stages of genocide, I'll give you a minute to look at those because we've talked about many of them today in different contexts. Uh, I don't think we didn't get to denial yet, but um, those, are the, those are the 10 stages. Stanton used to have eight stages, included 10. Um, inflation, I guess. Okay. So as, let, let's, let's walk down the path here with, the, uh, with, the, with these things. Classification. Uh, so the first thing that we see is a lot of bipolarization uh, in, uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, the, the, the Muslim population is the us, and the Hindus are the them. They are the other. We have created an other in the Hindu in Bangladesh. Um, once you create an other, you now can create a bad guy, and you can create a target. Um, identification of the Hindus with India. India is no fan, is no friend of Bangladesh, uh, and, and what you can do is identify the Hindu as members of the Indian tribe, and I'm using the word loosely, as opposed to the Bangladesh tribe. And so those are those folks are sleeping with the enemy as well. And then uh, accusing the uh, the non-Muslim Hindu of being infidel. We can classify them as, as, uh, as, as uh, religious criminals, more or less. Symbolization, the bindi, the, the, uh, the mark that many Hindu wear, uh, has become a symbol of uh, identifying the Hindu as, as a targeted individual. Similarly, the Om, the, the, the Muslims will paint the Om, the om which is a sacred figure, uh, on the homes of the uh, Hindu, and that lets the bands roving through the, the uh, countryside know which homes they can target. Uh, in discrimination, uh, I, we've already talked about Muslim versus non-Muslim. Uh, it's caused this mass immigration to India. Um, and then we see this idea of jihad. It, it shows up in uh, newspapers, uh, publications from madrasas. It shows up on the uh, airwaves of the radio stations, this idea that we should uh, we should visit jihad upon the Hindu, the non-believers. Not because they're Hindu, but because they're non-believers. Uh, enemy property order was, uh, what we did was, now we've identified them as the other, now we can take their property. That was um, uh, challenged in, in Bangladeshi Supreme Court, and, uh, and the Supreme Court overturned it, so they came up with the invested property law, which said that if you were not of, uh, if, if you were not of the Muslim, uh, community who could not own property. And then in 93 they broke that they, they passed a series of banking laws that have gotten more and more stringent through 2011. Uh, basically if you had money in a bank account and you were Hindu you couldn't get it, you couldn't have access to your funds. And similarly you couldn't also not get a loan to start a business or buy a home. Uh, the fourth stage is dehumanization. Now uh, we've been talk about dehumanization in a couple of contexts here. Um, the, similar to what we heard in, um, in uh, the Rohingya uh, example, they, the Hindu also were described as insects uh, by, the, uh, by the, uh, the mass media in, in Bangladesh. Uh, they are also treated as stateless. They are not, they are not declared stateless as they are in, in Myanmar, the Rohingya are in Myanmar, but they are treated as stateless people. They do not have uh, rights uh, before the courts. In an organization, uh, we see the temple destruction, uh, greater than 200, uh, 30, 32 were destroyed in, in less than 30 days, represents an organized uh, an element. The systematic rape campaign reflects an organization. This is something that doesn't happen spontaneously. It has to be organized in order to be prosecuted in that manner. A polarization, a religious polarization, I've already talked about but the social isolation as well. As you lose your rights and you begin to be more and more isolated and separated from the rest of the community, uh, and the secularist uh, Hindu are attacked for being not just not Islamic, not Muslim, but anti-Islam. Uh, and then the intermarriages are pro prohibited, and they were actually granting uh, divorces to Muslim women who had married Hindu men, uh, which is kind of an unusual state. Um, I've already talked about the legal repression and then the, the application of Sharia law 
Uh, this still has not passed in, in Bangladesh, but it comes forward all the time that they want to try to impose Sharia law and do away with the Constitution. There was a there was a power uh, that was signed in, in 1971. Uh, similarly, they've got eight, they sent 1,800 of the Jamaat al Islam uh, party members uh, to train with the Taliban in Afghanistan to learn how to fight. And they, they came back and have been uh, active, to say the least. Uh, persecution, we've already described that. Uh, extermination, and, and, and again, I'm back to the two things the murder and the systematic rape, as well as the expropriation. That's, that's important, too. And then, uh, the official minimization, uh, there's an interview uh, that was taped by the BBC about uh, 11 months ago where the Minister of the Interior uh, just says, well, they're bringing this on themselves because they're Hindu, so clearly they brought it on themselves. So, what, as we run through that, we, we, we look at what, the, what, those, uh, what those 10 stages tell us, um, and, and what, you know, if, if you look at the 10 stages, um, you, you can see that they hit each one of those marks to some greater or lesser degree. So then let's look at the character and situation in, in Bangladesh. And I'd ask the officers, you know, what's the nature of it? And we would hear that it's a durable, probably, I'm guessing that they would tell us that it's durable, but it's of low intensity. And that's perhaps why it doesn't rise to the level of public attention. Uh, does it meet the UN criteria? And again, the criteria are pretty nebulous, so it's a little hard to, to do that. Does it hit stamps 10 stages? And then some of the problems you come back with uh, to, to, to ask them to consider, what does in whole or in part mean? When, when you look at the, the definition of genocide, destruction in whole or in part, what is that number? What number is in whole or in part? Because the number of deaths in, 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 the, uh, in Bangladesh, number of uh, Hindu death after 1971 uh, are not significant. Well, it, I guess it's Jewish significant, but they, they're not. They don't rise to, to the level of horror that, you, that we've heard about in, in, in Burma and in other places up north, et cetera. Um, are the Indians complicit? And is that part of the problem? Are the Indians fomenting this? Are they, are they, are they, is, is this part of the problem? Is this an, are, are, are the Hindu and Bangladesh becoming pawns of interstate actions? And then finally, is this ethnic cleansing? Is that what this is? Is the intent here to eliminate the Hindu from, uh, from Bangladesh and make it an ethnically and religiously pure state? Those are, those are the questions we go after. And this is not a new problem. You know, it's a gray area. Uh, UN reaction has been very muted. Uh, the Bangladesh support <coughs> blue helmet actions might be part of that. Bangladesh is one of the most active supporters of UN actions. Uh, does the UN want to, you know, does the UN want to openly criticize Bangladesh? Could be that. Uh, <clears throat> this is an example of a slow burning uh, event, but because of the geographic shift, it more happily fits, in my opinion, into the definition of ethnic cleansing. Uh, and, and the reason for that is I don't think you ever get UN uh, agreement that the numbers of, of death uh, are enough to cross the genocide threshold. Um, and there's a very good chance that we'll not get any uh, international action here. I, I, I bring this up. Uh, this is ancient history, of course. Um, 1946. Uh, these things keep happening because you can you can you can get away with it with impunity. In other words, there's there's no consequence for, um, for for visiting death upon people uh, in, in many 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 cases. In Poland, in 1946, uh, the Kielce pogrom happened, where over 200 people were killed. Uh, well, now killed have been some died later on, other injuries, but a number of people were killed on that day. Uh, and this happened in 1946, and it basically didn't make the news change just because it wasn't important to the world. In the same way, the slow burning mass atrocities that are happening in Bangladesh to the Hindu don't rise to that threshold. That's the way.
Association. I'm a member of the Genocide Prevention Advisory Network, an international consortium of genocide scholars. Um, I've been taken in because of my 20 year focus on Sudan uh, and Sudan exclusively. Uh, necessarily, I looked at a lot of literature on genocide. I believe the ongoing genocide in Darfur in Western Sudan is now arguably the longest and most successful genocide in over a century. I might need to be qualified to think about uh, Myanmar and Bangladesh. And certainly more people died during the spasm of violence than was uh, Rwanda genocide. And the Nazi final solution killed many times the number of people who died as a result of genocidal violence in Darfur. But Germany lost World War II, and Nuremberg offered an historically crucial defeat for Nazi leaders and ideology. Go back to World War I, it is likely that some 1.5 million Armenians were killed in the Ottoman Empire in ways that we must attribute to the Turkish leaders of the time. Armenians, understandably, have long led their case for historical recognition of the genocide, which occurred in two phases, beginning in 1914. But there was an end point, generally regarded as 1923. The Ottoman Empire was dying after the war, although incredibly, debate still continues uh, about the reality of the Armenian genocide. My own extensive research suggests that some 600,000 people, civilians, have died from the direct or indirect effects of genocidal counterinsurgency warfare. So far as I know, I'm the only person who has done serious research on the issue of mortality in over a decade. Moreover, according to UN agencies, at least when they're not intimidated by the cartoon regime, some three million Darfuris are displaced from their homes and lands, and the future looks impossibly grim. Conditions in many camps for the displaced are lethal. The overwhelming, overwhelming majority of those people killed and displaced <coughs> are non-Arab African Darfuris, who actually constitute a majority in Darfur. Ethnicity, I will admit, is a very complex and much disputed issue in Darfur, or at least for those who pay attention to the region. Political biases in the issue, um, the issue are frequently in evidence. But let me begin my presentation today by uh, looking at two quotations that speak both to the issues of ethnicity and genocide, as well as to the question how many have died. The first comes from an August 2004 memo that was issued from the Mysteria, North Darfur headquarters, of the notorious Arab militia leader, Musa Hilal, leader of the Um Jalal clan of the uh, Mahani tribe, one of the Abala, or camel herding tribes of North Darfur. Genocide scholars often trip over themselves in parsing the language of the 1948 who I convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide, uh, debating in particular the phrase as such, which has been held to imply a distinctive men, uh, <coughs> mens rea or uh, state of mind, intent. Um, so with that in mind, as a challenge, the clarity of the memo from Mysteria is rather startling. This grim ambition has largely been achieved, as I argued in a 2015 monograph on violent expropriation of African farmland with the inevitable title of Changing the Demography. Some, to be sure, argue that perhaps Darfur was once the site of genocide in the early years, but no longer. The adequately targeted violence that was once so prominent a political advocacy cause has ended. 
And we have only pockets of violence. This is a view of, among others, the UN, although in fact the UN itself issued a report in 2005 that deliberately did not use the word genocide, a report uh, so corrupt that it would take an entire lecture to unpack all the errors in bad faith and the farce of investigation <coughs> which was based, I know, on the uh, investigators. So what is the state of genocidal affairs now? I would argue it's very much what was urged by Vice President of the Khartoum regime, Hassan Mohammed Abdel in December 2014, more than a decade after Musa Halal's brief genocide exordium. Speaking to regular soldiers and militia forces at a military base in Guba, North Darfur, this is according to a defecting militiaman speaking to Human Rights Watch. Asago told us to clear the area east of Jebel Mara, to kill any man. He said he wanted to clear the area of insects. That word in here. He said East Jebel Mara is the kingdom of the rebels. We don't want anyone there to be alive. And if you look at the violence um, that has ensued, East Jebel Mara was, in fact, simply a continuation of earlier uh, genocidal violence. Uh, East Jebel Mara is in the very center of uh, Darfur, that map that I began with, uh, didn't identify it, probably should have. Um, <coughs> Jebel Mara itself is the homeland of the Dar, as Darfur, of the four, the largest non Arab African tribal group in Darfur. But in East Jebel Mara, there are a number of other non-Arab African tribes, including the Berget, the Tunja, Sagawa, and a number of others. Sustained assaults that Hassado was urging have continued over the past three fighting seasons, the dry season, with incalculable suffering and destruction. It continues in and around Jebel Mara, the Mara area for nothing to this day. For my sins, I suppose, it's fallen to me to chronicle on an almost daily basis what we know of the violence and displacement and consequent mortality in the region and how profoundly the demography of Darfur has been shaped over the past 16 years. Since the Khartoum regime, I simply refuse to call it the government, since the Khartoum regime has succeeded in preventing international journalists and human rights observers from entering the region, it's become a black box. Our news comes almost entirely from one of the most remarkable journalistic enterprises of the digital age. Radio de Banga, based in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. More about this in a little bit, uh, but I visited their headquarters last June and was very much impressed by how dedicated they are working with truly really remarkable diligence and resourcefulness and assisted by literally hundreds of people reporting from the grounds around Sudan and Darfur and risking their lives to communicate to an indifferent world the daily horrors in Darfur and elsewhere in Sudan. When I had asked if my talk could be inflected to include issues of corruption, I had some very basic ideas about what I'd say on the subject. The cartoon regime, which came to power by military coup in June of 1989, almost 30 years ago, functions as a giant kleptocracy, one that has survived economically by virtue of oil revenues that began to flow in a big way in 1999. As it happens, here I began my own Sudan researches and advocacy. But oil revenues have shrunk dramatically for a number of reasons, including the secession of South Sudan in 2011. And right now, the Sudanese economy is collapsing. The country's inflation rate is well over 100% and is exceeded only by that of Venezuela. The Sudanese pound is in free fall and useless as a currency for imports. As a result, there are massive shortages of key commodities including wheat for bread, a food staple for many Sudanese, 
refined petroleum products, including diesel for transportation and water pumping, and essential medical products. And Call was watching the ball burst in, um, on this piece for the Enough Project. Years, years, decades of corruption have brought the country to the brink of disintegration. The news just today is of demonstrations throughout the country. Widespread calls for <coughs> demonstrations on December 25th uh, are making the rounds on Sudanese uh, social media. Political cronies who have supported the regime are increasingly cashing out and moving hard currency abroad, as are senior members of the regime itself, primarily to Gulf Arab states. There is no strategy for recovery, only for continuing profligate spending on the military and security services that keep the regime in power. It's a second song. The economy. All this may be ending soon, though. In September 2013, the regime was able to put down demonstrations in protest of rising prices only by issuing shoot to kill orders. This was established by Amnesty International and the African Center for uh, Justice and Peace Studies on the basis of moral visits in Khartoum, where a disproportionate number of people had been shot in ways that clearly indicated deliberate uh, uh, lethal force. When will this collapse come? I've been asked often enough, and I say glibly, when anger at what life has brought people becomes greater than the fear of facing live ammunition in the hands of police and security forces operating who shoot to kill orders. Or it's going to take a lot of brave persons to face down the daunting security forces of this regime. All of all signs, we really are that this moment is approaching. But in thinking about Hayat's question, I'd really like to flip the whole issue of corruption around. The question I'd really like to ask is, how has the international community responded to the Darfur crisis? And what evidence is there that in the face of what is conspicuously genocide, there has been a massive corruption of moral and political will, as well as self-serving expediency, and even an effort to diminish Darfur's reality for perceived national interest. What's framed in this way, the Darfur genocide has a much broader cast of characters than the genocide in Khartoum. To give you even a brief sense of how broad this cast is, I'm going to be moving much more efficiently now in my commentary. Um, by corruption, let me say that um, I mean, and I take here my this is uh, a book I published um, in 2012. It is it was far too big to be anything but an e-book online, uh, as to some 500,000 words and 200 photos. Um, but I took as my uh, epigraph a phrase sentence from John Weston, noted Victorian art critic, essayist. You may either win your peace or buy it. Win it by resistance to evil, buy it by compromise with evil. So what I mean by corruption in the international community is <laughs> compromising with evil. If you weren't aware, uh, Al-Bashir has been indicted by the International Criminal Court on multiple counts of genocide and crimes against humanity. And yet, since being charged in 2009, Al-Bashir has traveled the world constantly, freely, making scores of trips to some 30 countries, many of them signatories to the Rome Treaty that is the statutory basis for the International Criminal Court. I've myself twice been deposed by the ICC, and I can tell you that morale is poor, there's despair about the court's liability, and international support is with them. 
compromise in the deal. The US is even a signatory to the Rome Treaty. For his part, al-Bashir had proclaimed that he will run for president again in 2020. Uh, there's never been a free election in Sudan since um, he came to power, leading the National Islamic Party, as it was called, until 1999, when expediency dictated that they change the name to National Congress. <coughs> so what, who are these compromises for al-Bashir? Russia, China, Egypt, South Africa, Kenya, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, India, Iran, Kuwait, Nigeria, the list goes on and on. But in fact, there are many other compromisers. I pick the following people because it seems to me that my task is really that of an archivist. Uh, over 20 years, I've put together on my website well over two million words worth of analysis. I published hundreds and hundreds of articles in Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, two books, academic journals. But there's a sense of futility hanging over all of it. And today I'm today I'm gonna name names. So there's no point in having an archive History doesn't allow us to assign responsibility. That's Kofi Annan. Uh, Kofi Annan was head of UN peacekeeping in April of 1994 when the Rwandan genocide had uh, begun. He was also apprised by Romeo Dallaire in January of 1994 in the infamous genocide facts exactly what was happening. Those of you who have not read Philip Gravich's uh, account of the genocide facts, uh, it, it makes for horrific reading. I met Romeo Dallaire. He's a man of unimpeachable character. He's completely uh, strung out by post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, his memoir, Shake Hands with the Devil, one of the most disturbing reads I've ever made, and I've read a lot of disturbing things. Kofi Annan, in 2004, April, was Secretary General and spoke ominously about Darfur and the need for a possible international intervention. Well, two months later, his Under Secretary General of Political Affairs, Karen Prendergast, had made sure that kind of talk went away. But there was a lot of there was a lot of talk about genocide in Darfur at the time. The U.S. Congress unanimously, a bicameral, bipartisan vote, declared that genocide was occurring in Darfur. So did President George W. Bush, then Secretary of State Colin Powell, on the basis of a commission inquiry along the Darfur chain of order, said at the U.N. Security Council, genocide is occurring. Although he hastened to ask nothing follows from this and would have changed U.S. policy. But there were many others. The Parliament of the European Union voted something like 550 to 6 to declare that what was occurring was tantamount to genocide. You're not actually saying genocide if you say tantamount to genocide. You get to use such a word without being held legally accountable. You, you compromise. Besides the Parliament of the European Union, Bad Hashem in Israel, U.S. Holocaust Memorials Museum, numerous human rights groups, numerous genocide scholars, anti-genocide organizations, all declared it was genocide. But in fact, the very first declaration was by yours truly in the Washington Post in February of 2004. I'm going to indulge and read what I wrote at the time because nobody else had said it and because it was, in my view, even now looking back, what was clearly needed if the genocide was to be halted. February 25, 2004, Washington Post. The international community has been slow <coughs> to react to Darfur's catastrophe and has yet to move with sufficient urgency and commitment. A credible peace forum must be rapidly created. Immediate plans for humanitarian intervention should begin. The alternative is to allow tens of thousands of civilians to die in the weeks and months ahead. 
in what will be continuing genocidal destruction. It never occurred to me that I should be speaking of years or hundreds of thousands of deaths. By humanitarian intervention, I meant both the introduction of appropriate military force under UN auspices, if possible, and the existence that humanitarian supplies reach those in need. None of this was done, in part because Kofi Annan appointed this man to do a commission of inquiry, to head up a commission of inquiry. I mentioned this before. Cassese told his investigators before they went to Darfur that they would not be finding genocide. He had prejudged the issue. This comes directly from one of the people who was an investigator on the ground and had been from the Cold Palm mission as well. Those who had forensic skills, meaning they could dig where the bodies were and tell us how people died and how many, didn't put a spade in the soil. Not one, not once. They did interviews, for which they were not very well really trained. This comes from Deborah Bikin, a sergeant in the Ontario um, Provincial Police. She was shocked. Uh, Google Deborah Bodkin and you'll find a, a, an extraordinary narrative. But Cassese, because he did not find genocide, did exactly what Kofi Annan wants. Kofi Annan did not want a genocide finding that would have displayed the impotence, impotence of the UN Security Council. Because Russia and China, one or the other or both, would have vetoed any resolution based on the 1948 Convention, which does supposedly oblige prevention. Um, there are, of course, questions about what specifically in the Convention um, is obligatory, uh, but Kofi Annan did not want that debate to happen. Cassese helped him out. A huge part of the tragic history of the past 16 years is the continual acquiescing before Khartoum's demands, constraints, and general obduracy. The history of what mass, must pass under the rubric of peacekeeping and civilian protection has actually had almost nothing to do with these critical tasks, but it would take yet another lecture to explain how that is so. What we saw in 2004 was a small African Union force, famous. In 2005, we finally grown a bit. In 2006 summer, the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations put together a proposal for a real deal UN peacekeeping force. The only way to pass the UN Security Council is with China's vote, and China demanded as part of its vote that it be by the invitation only, that the military peacekeeping force be introduced only if Khartoum invited it in. Needless to say, Khartoum did not invite it in and was encouraged not to by this man, Dutchman, John Pronk, who within days of the passage of UN Security Council Resolution 1706, acquiesced and said, well, we don't want to press the issue. And then promptly got himself a PMG from Sudan by publishing something he knew would uh, irritate the government and get him to the which it did. Rudolf Agado was the first head of the UN African Union mission in Darfur and a liar and an expedient man. When he finished his two year stint, he was fired. He declared, I've achieved results in Darfur. There's no more fighting proper on the ground. Right now, there's no high intensity conflict in Darfur. Call it what you will, but this is what is happening in Darfur a lot of banditry, carjacking, and attacks on houses. 2010. Some of the worst of the genocidal destruction was yet to come. Successor, Ibrahim Gambara, uh, seen here chatting in a friendly way with Omar al Bashir at the wedding of the daughter of Musa Hilal to Idris Debi, the uh, brutal and Chad's regime. Gambari, on leaving, said, I'm gratified to note that barely 31 months into my tenure, all the goals set and objectives have largely been met. And I was, uh, achieved the Doha document for peace in Darfur, July 2011, and a total failure 
a powerful ad by the Qataris that led to absolutely no change on the ground in Darfur. None. <clears throat> Come back to that in a bit. Here is the UN resident and humanitarian coordinator just this past April, shaking hands and accepting the first class order of two months from President Al-Bashir. The UN is under strict orders to have no contact with indi people indicted by the ICC. Here she is smiling and accepting a meaningless award from the Barack Obama campaigned in, for president in 2008, declaring Darfur is a stain on our soul, and that as president, he didn't intend to abandon people or turn a blind eye to slaughter. Well, what did he do? He appointed a special envoy, probably the most difficult diplomatic task in the world at the time, Major General Scott Horish. He knew nothing about Sudan. He had no diplomatic experience. He had no Arabic. He was stubborn and did, in a very short period of time, extraordinary damage to the possibilities for peace. He organized one of the signatory parties to the Doha document for peace in Darfur, scorned by every single diplomat who knows anything about what it would take to bring peace to Darfur. In March of 2013, uh, 2009, March 2009, shortly into the Obama administration, within days of the time Gratian had been um, uh, appointed, the ICC indicted uh, Omar Bashir, this time for crimes against humanity, it would be the next year that he was indicted for multiple uh, counts of genocide. Well, the shutting down of humanitarian operations by the cartoon regime as a response, they expelled 13 of the world's finest humanitarian organizations, created a huge, huge shortcoming in aid for the millions of people displaced. John Kerry, because Christian didn't have any idea what to do, uh, simply lied. He went uh, on television and declared that we have an agreement. Khartoum has promised that aid will be fully restored by April. This is March of 2009. At the time I was talking to a senior official at the UN's office with the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, he simply laughed. He said, that's utterly impossible. We can't possibly replace such humanitarian capacity, even if we had a year. And in fact, we've never reached the point humanitarian capacity, and Kerry said it would be restored within a month. The most expedient of all, Prince the Mind, in an interview he gave to Ashark al Assad, a prominent Arabic news outlet, in December 2011, he said, we, the Obama administration, do not want to see the ouster of the cartoon regime, nor regime change. We want to see the regime carrying out reform via constitutional, democratic measures. There is not a single person in the world who knows anything about Sudan who believes this was remotely conceivable or possible. And yet there is a special envoy saying, we don't want to see regime change. We want to see this regime preside over the democratic transformation of Sudan. The ultimate compromise with evil. The New York Times, Jeffrey Kendall, feels surprised when a journalist talked to him before he published this article in 2012, in which he claimed that he had evidence that peace was had come to the dark world. But peace has settled on the region since the I said, Jeffrey, you, you, you can't possibly be serious. This is deeply, deeply wrong. You were taken to a Potemkin village. Don't you realize that? You couldn't be dissuaded. So here we have 2012, just as violence is about to explode again. It's ongoing, but about to explode in a big way. We have the New York Times saying, peace has settled on the region.
Samantha Power, whose book, Prone from Hell, is one of the most influential books I've ever read, was the UN ambassador, the Obama administration's second term, and in the last week declared in her last UN interview that there had been a sea change of improvement in humanitarian access in Sudan. This was a lie, an outright falsehood. I promptly called my best contact in the office of the Special Envoy for Sudan. There is no Special Envoy, just an office for the Special Envoy. I said, where did you get that? I said, I have no idea. No idea. It's not true. Nobody believed it was true. And yet it was the basis on which the Obama administration decided to lift economic sanctions on Sudan. It's about to remove it from the list of state sponsors of Paris. What's going on here? There's one issue between the United States and Sudan, between Washington and Khartoum. Khartoum wants economic sanctions lifted to be removed from the state sponsor of terrorism list. The US wants the intel, the counter-terrorism intel that they believe the Khartoum regime can spell, but can provide. That's why Lyman said we don't want to see regime change. That's why in 2010, one of the first things that was done under Gratian as special envoy was the decoupling of genocide in Darfur from the broader issue between Washington and Khartoum. That word decouple appears in the official State Department transcript, May 2010. May, November 2010. There it is, senior State Department official, unnamed, we're decoupling Darfur from the broader issue between Khartoum and Washington. Babo Mbeki, who's led the African Union uh, diplomatic efforts for the past <coughs> nine years, utterly corrupt, viewed by cartoons as a lackey, has a trust of nobody uh, in the political or military opposition. We put other faces out there, but Putin and Russia have sold uh, vast amounts of weapons to Sudan, including advanced military helicopters. Jet aircraft, big 29s, and a vast amount of other armaments. So has Belarus, Ukraine, Iran, China. Long list goes, the list goes on. Other forms of corruption, compromising with evil. This is the CEO of the uh, banking giant, the MP Paribas, which was uh, convicted of criminal money laundering by the US Justice Department. And although they were fined nine billion dollars, pretty hefty whack, uh, the real amount of money laundering, I know because I've seen the forensic accounting, runs to many, many tens of billions of dollars. The U.S. Justice Department said, in fact, that PMB Paribas functioned, in effect, as an offshore central bank for Sudan. And they knew what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. Frederica Mogherini, um, German uh, investigative reporters uh, found a memo from Mogherini, who's um, got the title you see there. Under no circumstances should the public learn what was said at the talks that took place on March 23rd, 2016. These were talks in which the Europeans decided in order to secure Khartoum's cooperation in preventing the migration of Africans to the European continent, they would provide them with surveillance equipment, with personnel registration equipment, and the Germans would even go so far as to build closed camps, as they were euphemistically called. Closed camps are camps you can't leave. When you're put in there, and you'll be put in there on the basis of your ethnicity or religion, you've been concentrated. You are in a concentration camp, and the Germans were going to build it. The list could go on a long, long way, but the corruption, moral corruption, it seems to me, is, is just staggering. And yet, Darfur, every day, struggles. And some of the struggles are easily seen. <clears throat> this is from just less than a week ago. The 
army base near Lahore, up in the upper right, uh, simply started firing shells at civilian villages. Three children were killed, young children killed. This happens all the time. The only people to report, not UNIMIT, which has a base 15 miles away. They didn't investigate. They didn't attempt to prevent. They simply watch from a distance. I give this argument a more academic character in a chapter for this book by my colleagues, the genocide prevention advisor, who just appeared. Uh, there's some very good essays in there. I won't characterize my own. Uh, but it's the best out there, I think, in a way of uh, addressing both the corruption that enables uh, genocide to continue and to prevent genocide from the beginning. 